You're muted, Ron. <laughs> See, I mentioned earlier that I would be one of the people that would forget to unmute themselves, and indeed, I, that's how I started the show. Welcome to the Magic of Live Production. How's it going, everybody? I am Ron Sparkman, and I'm here tonight with a group of incredible science communicators, um, and we're all here to support the man, the myth, the legend, Lee Giad, in this incredible program that he has created uh, called Passage. So, um, Lee, I do want to go to you on that one first, in case this is uh, you know first-time viewers. want to hear a little bit about what this is. Uh, why you're raising money, why it's a passionate thing to you. Then we're going to go to each of our science communicators, let them give a quick introduction, and we're just going to have a conversation about why this is so cool, why it matters, what the amazing work is that they do, and uh, just have fun for who knows how long. Last time it was supposed to be an hour. It was three and a half hours. And last time we raised uh, right around $2,500, so we have to beat that tonight. So, Lee, I'm going to go to you first and allow you to introduce yourself to everybody in this uh, very cool project. All right. Well, first of all, everyone, uh, thank you for being here. And um, Passage is an amazing project that all of you guys and many more science communicators are involved in. And it's really exciting to see the uh, overwhelming support that it's been getting for, for the amount of time that it's been up, which is actually, wow, not even a month. <laughs> we haven't, it, it's barely been a month since the project has been live. And um, we've already raised $10,000 for school supplies and technology and lab equipment, classroom stuff, and much, much more software, everything that you can think of that is needed for STEM education, we've raised it for underprivileged kids in schools in Latin America. So the whole premise of PASSAGE, it stands for Providing Aid in Science for South America's General Education. And what we're doing is in December, 2021, we're flying our research aircraft, the Spirit of Science, carrying all of these supplies and more that we're actually going to be um, shipping to international airports and picking up along the way so we can donate as much as we possibly can to, to our schools. And uh, we have about a dozen schools in Latin America and in the Caribbean that we're going to bring these supplies to. And um, on top of that, we have uh, experiments that are sent in from kids all over the world that are going to be flying on this aircraft, meteorological experiments, um, physics experiments, uh, anything that has to do with aviation, altitude, anything, um, we're going to be asking for submissions uh, once we get closer to the actual flight next year. Um, and the amazing science communicators that are joining us today are going to be creating what's called a Passage Science Masterclass series uh, based on what they do and uh, the incredible work that they do and, and whatever they studied um, or currently study. They're just going to share their experiences in multiple different languages, actually. Uh, and create this beautiful library for kids all over the world, not just in Latin America, uh, to get in, get an interest in science, learn how to get those careers in science and take the right steps um, toward achieving their dreams, whatever it is, doctors, astronauts, um, and everything in between. So it's an exciting project. We want to raise $50,000 for these supplies, and that's just the supplies. We have amazing partners that are covering all the other boring costs, fuel, aircraft expenses, and all that other stuff. Um, but it's very, very exciting, and uh, we're going to have a great conversation tonight. I hope everybody will stick around, and uh, we'll see how long this lasts. Last time it was three hours, uh, but we did raise $2,500, so let's beat that today. Tell your friends, join the stream, and visit our GoFundMe, Passage Science on GoFundMe. So, Ron, I'll turn it over to you, and uh, let's get started. All right, all right, all right. Sounds great to me. So, uh, I'm going to go to my digital left. Yeah, I think that's what it is. I don't remember exactly how that works. Cap, what's up? Hold on, say high five. Did we do that right? That's creepy. Now it's over. So it's, I don't know, doing a thing over here. But yeah, uh, Kevin, we'll go to you first. Um, and I'm, really, I'm kind of excited about this because I think with both Kevin and Dr. Harrison, I have become the person that has interviewed you the most now <laughs> after this live stream. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty I'm pretty happy about that one. Like, I just need to start marking that down. How many times have you interviewed Kevin? 117. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> we do this, we do this all the time. <laughs> At least six. No, we're probably like 10. Yeah, we are really around 10. So, Kevin, we'll start with you. Uh, go ahead and let us know who you are, what you do, where you just came back from on your awesome trip that just made everybody on this live stream. <laughs> everywhere. From everywhere. <laughs> What's up, everybody? My name is Kevin Jada Brun. I'm a former NASA rocket scientist. So I was working at NASA JPL for a few years designing spacecrafts. My main focus was on the Europa lander. Now, no, that one is not going forward at the moment. We're not going to be landing on Europa to test for the signs of life yet. So we're putting that one on the back burner. But I left JPL a couple of years ago because I really fell in love with science education and science communication. 
I saw so many opportunities out there to educate others about the wonders of space exploration and its importance to us here on Earth. So that's what I do full time now. I make videos. I teach space camps all around the world. I usually teach one in South Korea every summer, but this year I was not able to travel there. But the travels I did do that Ron wants me to talk about is I just did a cross-country road trip after finishing joining a YouTube channel called The King of Random. I was there in Salt Lake City, Utah for seven weeks filming videos for them and then did an amazing road trip home where I stopped in Yellowstone, Craters of the Moon National Monument and Preserve. It's in Idaho. If you've never heard of it, check it out. The Apollo 14 astronauts actually trained there, figuring out, uh, working with the geologists, how to collect the best moon rock samples and then keep them pristine for the journey back home to Earth. Went to Arches National Park in Moab, went down to Monument Valley where Forrest Gump stopped running, down to Lake Powell and Antelope Canyon, and then made my way back here to LA, which is where I still live and work. So I teach people about space as much as I can. That is my main goal and passion. And so just a quick, a real quick look, here is the trailer for The King of Random. So Ooh. if you've never seen it, <laughs> it is about to play in about two seconds. Here we go. I don't Sometimes think I wonder why I do the things I do, and then I realize I don't care. This was fun. They blow things up for science. Ooh, I'm in it. We're going to see what happens when we put soda in a vacuum chamber. If there was a caveman building a Mars rover, how would we build the drill? Can we make a six foot tall pixie stick? There's really only one thing left to do. Ah, it worked. I don't have a good way to put that out. In today's video, we're making bricks out of glue. We're gonna see if we can hold boiling water in our hands. We will be extracting DNA from 24 pounds of strawberries. All right, now what were you expecting? Not exactly, All but right. good to learn. Let's try the next one. All right, let's go for it. Rulers and GoPros. That one like splatted all over my leg. Let's get some extra people. <laughs> all right, that is my That's first awesome. time seeing that. I didn't know they made a new one, so that is really cool. Yeah, we did things I, like... I noticed how new it was. I'm like, I bet Kevin's in this one because I just have a feeling. And I was correct. So the first thing you saw was me on a longboard powered by a fire extinguisher. I wanted to see what types of devices we could get propelled with a fire extinguisher. So we did a swing, a longboard, a rolly chair. And then we went in a pool and stuck the fire extinguisher underwater. And very, very slowly, we were moving around the pool. But yeah, it's like... Pretty much, I trained my brain to think like a 12th grader or a 12 year old to come up with these like ideas. And then I got to put my science brain to it and explain what's happening and figure out different aspects to take to it. I feel almost like a myth buster, but we're not busting myths. We're just doing crazy random science stuff. Uh, so, so, so awesome cool. indeed, Kevin. So, uh, yeah, I know somebody was jumping in there because I had muted myself again. So please go ahead. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay, uh, Dr. Tanya Harrison, we will go to you next. Uh, give us kind of a breakdown of all the cool things you do as, um, you know, a professional Martian. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm Tanya Harrison. Thanks for having me tonight. Uh, as Ron said, I call myself the professional Martian because over the past 12 years, I've worked in science and mission operations for a few different NASA Mars missions, including um, Opportunity, Curiosity, and the Perseverance rovers, and the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, I, my PhD is in geology with a specialization in planetary science and exploration. And so I actually worked on the geology of the surface of Mars for my research, mostly on landslides, uh, and spent many, many years mapping out every single feature on Mars called a gully, um, made a map of 5,500 of them. And uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, but now I do things a little bit more close to Earth or close to home. Um, I am the director of science strategy for an Earth observing company called Planet Labs, which operates the largest constellation of Earth observing satellites currently in orbit of our home world. And we image the entire planet every day at three meter resolution. So we can see things on the ground. We can resolve things that are about nine meters in size. Uh, we do that every day to look for signs of change. So we try to monitor the effects of climate change. We look at how cities are changing over time. We monitor human rights abuses around the world to try and get governments to take action against them. Um, so quite a change coming from the world of Mars. Um, I also do a lot of science communication work. So you might recognize me as Tanya of Mars from Twitter if you hang out in Twitter. Um, 
I recently wrote a book uh, called For All Humankind, which is a collection of stories of, well, true stories of people who watched the Apollo 11 landing live as it happened, but grew up outside of the United States to try and get the international perspective. So we have everything from uh, a woman who was five years old growing up near the border of Bangladesh to um, a 44 year old Holocaust survivor from Lithuania to a 22 year old Somalian engineer. Um, and hearing all these people's different stories were really exciting to see how humans walking on the moon really impacted humanity as a whole. Um, I've also done some videos. I have a video series with Honeywell Aerospace you can find on YouTube called How to Build a Spaceship, where each episode talks about a specific type of system on a satellite so you can learn how all those things work. Um, and lots more projects in the works. Another book that I've talked about in a couple of the Explore Mars um, meetings that we've had recently. Uh, I just never sleep, so that's really the short answer to all of it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can say I understand. <laughs> uh, next up, Giant. Oh, go ahead, buddy. Yeah, I just had a question. So um, I know that you do like um, science fiction consulting. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think it's pretty cool. Like that's a cool gig to have. Yeah, sure. Um, see, I do so many things that I forget all of them. <laughs> uh, so I've done consulting for... Um, some science fiction authors, so folks that want to make sure that their stories are scientifically accurate. Um, those have included folks like the person that invented the Belter language for The Expanse. That was pretty cool. Um, I was also a science consultant for a, a television show that was pitched to CBC in Canada about Mars. Um, and my dream would be to do science consulting for something like Star Trek or you know a movie like The Martian. So if anybody needs a science consultant for their Mars themed book or movie, give me a call. <laughs> That's awesome. Super cool. Awesome. Um, and Ron, you've had me on the camera the whole time, so nobody I, could. I, I did indeed because pitch. so we can't get all the comments from everything. So I was checking Twitch and Facebook to make sure mm -hmm. that we like there wasn't any questions or anything yet that I missed. And I completely missed uh, switching over to, to Tanya. So Lee's actually a ventriloquist and can sound just like Tanya. So it's very impressive. Yeah, uh, you. You know, it's, it's this skill that he has that we weren't going to talk about till later. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> that was on me. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> no, <right>. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to keep cool, up with it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so next up, we're going to go to Tracy. So this is uh, my first experience with Tracy, and actually a lot of folks that are on the on the call tonight or are on the stream tonight. So um, Tracy, I was actually introduced to you from Lee, and actually, so Tracy, uh, and I think honestly the bottom half of the screen other than, than coffee. So uh, I'm excited to hear about everybody here that are uh, new to me. So Tracy, let's go with you first. Hey everybody, my name is Dr. Tracy Finara and I'm an environmental engineer. I basically work to extend humanity's time on Earth. So pretty much anything that you could think that would kind of fit that definition, I've probably done a project in it. So I started on my path uh, because a fourth grade teacher told me about something called Love Canal. It was a location where industries were dumping toxins into a waterway that was leaching into soil and groundwater People started building houses and schools and there were birth defects and cancer clusters. And that made me realize, and that was right down the street for me. And I started to realize how everything in this world is connected. What we put into the environment eventually comes back to affect our health. Later in life, I heard about this field of study, which I'd never heard about before, where I can provide clean water and food to people and protect people from natural disasters and build things and design things. And I was like, sign me up. I want to be a silent superhero. And so I became an environmental engineer. I worked in land development as a design engineer on water projects around the world. But I realized how we were mismanaging our land, how we were approaching land development all wrong. So I went back to school to prove that there was a better way through sustainable design. When I graduated, that whole process of going through grad school made me realize how important communication was. I realized that my friends were throwing garbage out their car windows and I asked them, you know, where, where do you think that that goes? And every single one of them either didn't know or thought it went to a wastewater treatment plant. And when I told them that every single drop of rain that lands in the state of Florida goes to a natural water body, I noticed that their behaviors changed. Because their behaviors changed, I thought I can 
do anything. This is how I'm going to save the world, right? Well, I tried to get my parents to stop buying bottled water and I hit a few road, roadblocks. If you guys have ever tried to change your parents' mind about anything, good luck. But apparently the kids are the ones preach, that- Preach, sister, preach. <laughs> apparently the kids are the ones that, that have the most impact. And that's why I work so much with, with kids. So eventually I bought my parents a Brita filter. They never bought another bottled water again. So I came up with this process for science communication and I took a job with Moat Marine Laboratory where I, I, I did so many different projects, mostly focused on developing technology and tools to protect the public from a harmful algae called Crania brevis or Florida red tide. And what makes that algae so special, I mean, there are thousands of species and only a few are, are actually toxic. And this is one of them in the Gulf of Mexico and the toxin can actually aerosolize. So it goes up in there moves on shore with winds and causes people to have coughing, respiratory irritation, or uh, sneezing at GIs in people that are healthy. But for those that have asthma or COPD, this can be really serious. And not to mention the mass amounts of marine life that that it takes every year. So I, I redeveloped a uh, website and developed three apps to alert the public of where these effects are. And now we have close to 2 million users on these apps, which is pretty cool because it's so important to protect the public so we can tell them what beaches to go to to have a healthy experience. I also worked with NASA on a project um, to, it's, it's basically image detection. It, it allows our citizen scientists to take a sample of water, put it underneath the microscope, upload a video a uh, 30 second video in an app that has an algorithm that automatically calculates the concentration of this toxic species of, of algae uh, by its shape, size and movement. That information goes to a NOAA respiratory irritation model for the public to get those respiratory irritation reports. Uh, since then, I have recently moved on to be the Coastal Modeling Portfolio Manager at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So my portfolio is uh, pretty much all of ocean coastal modeling. Uh, and I run, um, right now I'm running a, uh, a grant process. It's called the, the Coastal Ocean Modeling Test Bed. It sounds boring, but it's really important for us to be able to protect our coastlines, coastal resilience, hurricanes, uh, ocean acidification, biologic changes. It, it, it's a really diverse uh, modeling portfolio. And I'm, I'm super excited about it because it really takes into account all of these systems that that are changing constantly that that we need to understand to better protect ourselves from from the changes that are going to occur. Uh, climate change is is really, I mean, you guys know that's shaking things up. But um, I'm I'm super excited to be here. This is this is awesome. I love everything uh, about this this mission um, and my mission in Spectral Planet. Uh, is very similar where it, you know, really wants to focus on um, those that don't, you know, haven't had the upbringing that, that I did um, and, and bring information and tools and hands-on activities to those kids um, so that they, they can have a genuine love for science and environment, no matter what career path they go through. It's really important that people understand how the world works so they can make educated decisions in their everyday life to protect the environment that they love. Um, and I also do a bunch of TV. I was on Mythbusters uh, and What on Earth, Weird Earth, uh, Exploration Station Awesome Planet, uh, Mission Unstoppable, and, and a bunch of other, other really awesome shows. Uh, and me and my friend Tamara have a comic book called Seekers of Science. And uh, we're just, you know, I, I'm really fortunate to have all of the opportunities that I have have had through science. Um, and I just want other people to experience them as well. That is so awesome. Um, I, so that, that is an amazing introduction to you. You're doing so much. Thank you for, for joining us tonight and sharing a little bit about it. We have such an esteemed panel this evening. Uh, and we're really excited to uh, kind of continue the conversation. Uh, Kafefe, let's go to you next. Tell everybody how you got that nickname. Um, and uh, you are actually my witness that Lee can't drive. I think, <laughs> I think we won't talk about the nickname. Um, regarding Lee's driving skills, 
I'm going to go ahead and say that it was 3 a.m. and we'd spent 24 hours being awake and being, you know, all excited and adrenaline filled because of that launch. So I'm going to say that he drove real fast. But uh, beyond that, I, uh, <clears throat> I'm not going to bring Lee's driving skills into, into question any further. Um, so, yeah, I'm Covey Rose, uh, founder and editor of Fun Fact Science. Um, I got into science way after high school. Um, honestly, I was watching the previous stream that you guys did um, yesterday, and it was just amazing to hear how many of these other science communicators you know, weren't one of these crazy geniuses that all their life they always knew uh, what they were going to do and how they were going to get into science and change the world. And it's kind of like Tracy was just saying now, you know, it's it's one small thing that, that makes you say, okay, you know, this this is important for me. This is something that I want to do to to change the world. Um, and honestly, that mission sounds amazing. So so yeah, so I I run Fun Fact Science. Um, just launched the website recently, um, and for the most part, it's just trying to give scientists a good platform where they can uh, speak their truth. They can present their research in a way that's accessible to uh, to as many people as possible. Um, working on a few other uh, smaller projects, but this honestly is something that I'm super, super excited about. I think it's such an amazingly good cause to be going out and providing over 2,000 kids in Latin America with these opportunities that I really do believe will spark the next generation of scientists and engineers and, and astronauts in Latin America. So uh, really happy to be here. And yeah, guys, um, I just want to say that there's a saying in aviation that um, bad drivers are great pilots. Oh, there we go. Jeff knows what's up. <laughs> I'll, never, I'll never forget a friend of mine who, who was training to get his pilot's license and it almost had an accident because he was driving home from the airport and a car in front of him after a driving, after a flying lesson and a car in front of him stopped suddenly and instead of braking, he just pulled his wheel back in his car. Um, <laughs> yeah, the most dangerous part of flying is driving to and from the airport. It's driving to and from the airport. Okay, that's, that's actually kind of funny. I like that a lot. So, went down the wrong pipe. I took a drink when he said that, and that was that was awesome. Okay, sorry. Let me let me get that out. So, um, uh, Kavi, obviously, it's great to have you on. And uh, so he's in Tel Aviv, and it's like, what time there now? It's uh, 3.30 in the morning. Uh, you guys are all probably drinking coffee and gin and tonics, and I'm drinking my coffee, trying to trying to stay awake for you guys. So if I start nodding off, just just like nudge me and shout my name. <laughs> well, uh, man, we are so glad to have you on tonight to uh, have part of this conversation with Pleasure us for, for as long as you can stay awake. Uh, so next, we're going to go to Dr. Patel. Please introduce yourself. Let everybody know what you're doing. Uh, and Tracy, I'm sorry. I didn't know that you were a doctor. I would have introduced you as Dr. Uh, Fanara. My fault. So now that I know better, I'll make sure to do that in the future. So uh, Dr. Patel, please give us an introduction. Let us know who you are. Everyone. My name is Dr. Parshadi Patel. Um, I'm an astrophysicist, a science communicator, and a STEM um, education researcher based in London, Ontario, Canada. Yes, it's London. <laughs> it's the other London that is not very famous. Um, I, I'm really all about space, uh, as you may find in my background. Um, but my journey didn't really start here in Canada. Um, I was born and brought up in India. Uh, where I didn't really have access to the skies that I actually have here in Canada. Uh, so my introduction to space actually happened on um, just a visit to a planetarium with a family um, at a family vacation. And I didn't really know much about stars up until that point. But after that visit, I just felt like um, I guess stars were calling <laughs> in some ways. Um, but I just had more questions and my parents were, you know, they were not in this kind of field. And so they didn't really know much about space. And so the only way they really would uh, quench my thirst of all of these questions and, uh, you know, uh, all these uh, kind of ideas that I had about space were with books. So I collected a lots and lots of books. And every time someone would ask me for a gift, I would say, just get me a space book. Um, and so one, at one such time, my aunt, who lived here in Canada, um, came to India. She asked my mom, uh, you know, what should I bring for your daughter? And she said, oh, you know, she, she likes space. Just bring something space related and she'll be happy. And she brought me a telescope. And it wasn't really big, but it was, you know, big enough to see Saturn, Jupiter, uh, Mars, and Moon. And the first time I saw it, I was like, 
um, amazed at what's in the night sky because before that I never seen anything through a telescope. And and that moment I think I decided that that's what I want to do with my life. Though you know, <laughs> don't no one sits around with a telescope, uh, at least not a, a, a professional astronomer, um, and looks at the night sky. And we have computers to do that, and you know, observational astronomers who do that. Um, but I, I came to Canada to study astronomy. Um, I moved here, um, you know, I did four years of my undergrad, actually, and something to, to add to the previous conversation, um, I, I wasn't a great student, you know, I wasn't actually great to even get into engineering back home or any other courses. So I did pure sciences, which is considered as like one of the, the, the programs where you go where you cannot get into any of the schools. Um, like engineering, medicine, or pharmacy, um, but I was I was happy because I was studying physics, and so I decided to come here. Um, and you know, my trajectory kind of just changed the moment I learned more about space. And I, I came to Western, which is where I work now, to do my masters and my PhD. And I got to study massive stars, stars that are much more massive than our sun. Um, I studied how they form, how disks around them form, and how those disks actually affect the stars. Um, and I had amazing opportunities uh, using, you know, Canada France. So I telescope for my research and be able to, uh, just like Tanya, also do a specialization in planetary science and space exploration. Um, and that kind of opened my horizons about what I could do with, uh, in addition to just studying astronomy. Uh, and so, you know, I always had a passion about uh, space and I always wanted to talk. But when I was young, I was kind of discouraged. Um, you know, people made comments that, you know, my voice is not made for radio or TV or you know, just someone talking. And so I never thought that I could do something like science communication. But when I was offered an opportunity to, uh, you know, help with a radio uh, or a podcast, it was radio at that time. Now it's a podcast. Um, I just thought, you know, no one cares when you're listening about science, right? Like, how does my voice, what kind of voice I have uh, make any difference? Um, and the fact that, you know, I had just immigrated. Um, I wasn't really sure about the way I was speaking, if people would accept my accent or the way I talk. And um, radio actually really helped me to to get over that uh, initial hesitation of doing science communication. And once I started, I think I didn't look back. And now um, I, I manage the um, education outreach program at the Institute for Earth and Space Exploration, where I get to uh, work with educators and students, as well as public, almost um, every other day, which is which is an amazing opportunity that I currently have. Um, and in addition, I get to work with, you know, industry partners as well as, um, you know, government organizations like the Canadian Space Agency um, and work on their education outreach program. So, you know, I have had um, an amazing, uh, amazing time here in Canada and all the opportunities that have been offered to me. Um, I think when Lee contacted me about Passage, what really, um, grabbed my attention was the fact that, you know, when I was growing up in India, I really um, didn't, did not feel that, uh, you know, I had uh, access to a lot of things uh, like hands on activities and, you know, kind of role models that I had wished I had. And so this kind of brings that opportunity to students, uh, you know, in Latin America who could um, who could get access to these kinds of things and hopefully, you know, um, have um, have their future in STEM education. Um, and I guess other than that, um, I, you know, I love uh, night sky just in general. So you would often find me uh, probably driving somewhere away from my city, uh, trying to capture the night sky. And I have kind of reignited the passion for painting um, and photography in, during the pandemic. So yeah, that's about me. So incredibly awesome. And fun fact, yeah, playing also... off the... Oh, sorry. Playing off the um, the stereotype that all Canadians know each other, Parshi and I did our PhDs together in Canada. <laughs> I mean, you guys are like like two of what ten people in Canada, or that sounds about right. At least in the Canadian space scene, we literally all know each other because I think most of us went to school together, and if we didn't, the other people were our <laughs> advisors. <laughs> That's funny. And now uh, we know why Tanya can't say no to anything ever. She's Canadian. That that adds it up. <laughs> yeah, and um, Dev, for anyone that doesn't know, um, Parshati has an amazing uh, Instagram kind of update type deal with her um, astrophotography. I voted for the other one that the majority didn't want, but it's fine. Um, I think she. What were you trying to do? You were trying to print the the photo. 
another thing that has you know kind of happened over the summer is after you know having so many pictures of the night sky i think i went on six trips uh with you know my astro buddies and now i have so many pictures i'm like i should probably print them and put them up somewhere um so i was asking people to vote today um which of my comet pictures i should be printing uh because i have this giant uh, i don't know how i ended up getting a giant frame but i have that and i'm like you know I, I need something that is not galaxy because I have a lot of galaxy pictures that I've printed. Um, and so Comet obviously was my choice, but I was confused whether I should go with Comet by itself or Comet with Auroras, which is a unique combination. And looks like the Comet with Auroras actually won. So I'm gonna be printing that soon. <laughs> nice. Yeah, they're super cool. So, so awesome. So I do know that we have um, one of our speakers has to go a little bit early. So we're going to jump to her first and then we will go back to Bianca. So Angelica, if you'd like to share with us what it is you do, uh, all the cool things you're up to and why you might have to leave a little early because you have homework to do, I believe is what you were letting us know. <laughs> um, hi, so my name is Angelica. Um, I am a student still. I'm studying aerospace engineering with a specialization in astronautics and a minor in space studies. So in other words, I'm a professional nerd or trying to be one. Um, I kind of became a science communicator by accident. Um, as Lee knows, I'm originally from Venezuela. So, you know, one of the countries we're trying to help. And in my country, there's really not that much science going on, which is why we're doing this project to begin with. Um, and I just remember when I was a little girl that um, one of the things that really got me into it is I went to a museum and they just happened to have this tiny section of science on it, right? And it was like the Apollo 11. Um, and I just fell in love with it. But I, um, I never thought I could do it because, you know, science is for the Americans and science is for the Einsteins and the other people, you know, not, you know, a Venezuelan girl like me. So um, I let it go for a while, which is very sad. Um, but then I moved here to the United States, which I'm very lucky about, and I am living my version of the American dream. Um, so now I'm doing rocket science, which is amazing. Um, and yeah, it's kind of unique that Lee and I are, um, that got me into this because I was kind of already doing some things um, for students in Latin America. So I would like gather some supplies and send them, but never at this scale and never as big as I always wanted it to be. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I do have a couple projects going on, which are very cool. Um, I had two with NASA, so um, I did basically a camera mount for the International Space Station. Um, and that was tested at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab over at Houston, which was very exciting. And um, I just culminated one, which was a regolith, initial regolith collection device. So essentially, when astronauts are planning to go on the Artemis moon mission um, and they just get to the moon, uh, one of the things they have to do is collect a sample of moon dust and rocks just in case everything goes away and they have to leave quickly, right? So it's like not completely a failed mission. They at least got this one sample. Um, so I helped at making the um, initial designs of what that tool might look like. Um, we don't know if they're going to send it or not. And we also don't know if they're going to send the camera mount to International Space Station. Um, but we're waiting for it and I'm very hopeful. And aside from that, I am starting hopefully to work on solar sails with a lab here, the propulsion lab here at Embry-Riddle, because I go to um, the university called Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. <laughs> Thank you. It's a basically a pilot in science school. So if it does your thing, this is a place to be. And yeah, I do have to leave a little early. I can hang out for a while, but um, I do have homework. <laughs> Thermodynamics calls for me. And aside from that, yeah, I mean, I just kind of became an, a communicator by accident, but this is very exciting. Awesome, awesome stuff. And uh, to the last of our panelists for now, there's possibility we're going to have some hop-ins a little bit later this evening. Uh, but we get to go to Bianca and listen to her about all the cool stuff that she does. So, Bianca, uh, by the way, killer handle at Pink Rocket Ship. I love that. So tell us a little bit about you and what you do. <laughs> Hello. Um, my name is Bianca Vasquez at Pink Rocket Ship on Twitter and MySpace, no, uh, Instagram. Um, so a couple of little projects I've done. I 
worked on an atmospheric water generator with UC Santa Barbara. Um, I didn't go there, but I'm just really good at butting my way into things. Um, so I was a co-leader of the condenser team. Um, because of Corona, we didn't go farther than the prototype, but you know, prototype is always awesome. Um, that was my first hands-on experience. Um, that same year, I did NASA NCAS, which is a program you do for about six weeks online with NASA. If you do well on your solo project, you get invited to the on-site experience, and I was able to go to JPL. We did a mini rover competition, and my team won, which is exciting. Um, right now, I'm doing a co-op with Lockheed Martin's Space Division. Um, I also run my organization, an international organization, Society of Women in Space Exploration. Um, we promote more diversity in women in space. We have chapters all across the U.S. and a couple, a couple of international chapters in Australia, Costa Rica, Honduras um, are a couple of them. And I'm also involved in a project called Space Hero, which is a global casting show where contestants all over the world can compete for a trip to the International Space Station, which is exciting because that would be the first time a non-billionaire, non-astronaut, non-military personnel will go to space. Um, yeah, so I got into all of this stuff because, well, I think all of us as humans, we're naturally very curious and explorers. So as a kid, I always was very fascinated by all of this. I never considered it as a career though, because as a Mexican American, um, I didn't see a lot of people that looked like me, that resembled me. I didn't have many role models, um, but it wasn't until college and I went to a SpaceX launch here, um, I forget the name, but like an hour north from Santa Barbara. And I was incredibly shocked by just the experiencing the launch itself, but I was also very much in love with the human experience. Um, just a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of different types of people, families, friends, kids, photographers, people by themselves, couples, all types of people came together and we experienced something so majestic and we were all so happy and we were all so just you know amazed by what, what humans can do when we work together so that humanity aspect and that unity part of it all is what really drives me to to pursue a career in space exploration so incredibly awesome i mean what a lineup tonight there's everybody people doing tv and sending people to space and all kinds of awesome stuff um, so I guess I don't, I don't think I did this last time for those that don't know me. Um, one, thank you to all the panelists for giving us a quick rundown of who you are. If you're unaware of who I am, uh, I'm Ron Sparkman. Uh, you can find me at the space dude. Uh, I do all kinds of stuff much like, uh, Dr. Harrison. Uh, I don't sleep either. We've actually made a joke that we were going to, uh, set up a, a live stream to do an interview. And then both of us were separately in our own homes going to go take a nap. So that way we could get some sleep in. Uh, so, you know, it's always awesome. I get to talk to amazing people like this. I do this, uh, sometimes as many times as three or four times a week with these large panels of incredible science communicators from all over. And then I also have a space media co company called Stardom. Uh, and so you can find that at Stardom Space everywhere. And I love to host really cool stuff like this. And I, I got uh, very fortunate to meet Lee when he and I were part of the student astronaut contest for uh, Emily Calandrelli's uh, exploration outer space a couple of years ago. And Lee is still the reigning winner because they haven't been able to have yeah. a follow-up one yet. So Lee is still technically you know, uh, king of the hill on that one. So uh, we became Longest good friends. Running. <laughs> Longest running. You definitely got that. I'm still the oldest. I'm still the oldest person to be a finalist, I think. And I'm probably going to hold on to that one for a while. Like the old guy showed up. I'm like, I've got money to pay somebody that's a videographer. I can do this. Uh, so that's the only reason I got in there. Everybody else was just so much cooler than me. And I'm so honored to know each and every one of them. And uh, so, yeah, so that's kind of a little bit of what I do. Love having conversations like this. And we have so many cool uh, people here. So, Obviously, passage is a big thing, uh, and one of the things we want to talk about tonight, obviously, is that we are fundraising. And uh, so if you are unaware of it, you can go check that out. I've got the link uh, scrolling there at the bottom. And actually, the first technical person to uh, to do um, a, uh, a donation today to help the cause uh, break that next big mark was Kevin De Bruin five hours ago, who gave twenty bucks. So we are only, uh, yeah, we are Hello. we are just uh, we are just forty nine dollars away from hitting eleven thousand dollars. So if you haven't donated yet, uh, go and check it out. And before we dive into some conversation, Lee, can you tell people the cool stuff that they can uh, that they can get whenever they pledge and uh, give their money? Give your money. So uh, yeah, Lee. <laughs> 
<clears throat> yeah, so we actually, there's a very exciting thing um, that we have going on. Let me. Uh, 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 okay, there we go. Drop some. So this is my old space helmet. It's not old. It's actually fairly new, but it got destroyed um, because we were filming a really cool announcement for what I'm about to tell you about. So it's, I guess, early. Stay. Okay, this is not working out. Um, but uh, we partnered, Passage has partnered with a company called M Mars, formerly Mars Academy USA, to give away six astronaut crew positions at their brand new uh, Martian training center in the Mojave Desert being built right now um, and is an incredible opportunity. They've been super generous and super supportive of this project. Each ticket is worth uh, $3,500 and you will be spending a week. Uh, every time you go outside, you have to wear a space suit. Every time uh, you wanna eat, it has to be freeze dried. Uh, and, and you got to just do active research. It's not, you know, some kiddie camp or, uh, you know, tourist attractions. This is, a, this is real astronaut training. And um, you have the opportunity to win this experience uh, if you donate $25 or more. So you can donate $25. And every time you donate $25, you get an entry into that raffle. Um, and the winners will be announced uh, later this year once we hit our goal. And uh, the announcement video should be up pretty soon. I know I sent Ron a picture, so he'll put that up. Um, at some point throughout the night. Um, but yeah, there's a lot more stuff. If you can't donate $25, we're still doing a documentary film throughout the entire flight, the entire project. Um, <clears throat> and you'll get early access to watch that documentary online. Um, but there's more rewards, t-shirts, mission patches designed by one of NASA's patch artists, uh, Tim Gagnon, um, tickets to Kennedy Space Center for our documentary premiere, uh, access to the runway to watch the spirit of science take off to Latin America and come back to land. Um, a lot of really cool stuff, even a flight on the plane. Um, so check it out. Go to uh, the GoFundMe. There's a link where you can see all of the rewards and uh, anything and everything helps. And uh, this Mars thing is really excited. I just went into the middle of the ocean with a spacesuit. So uh, my spacesuit is in one of that box all the way in the corner down there. Uh, and it's soaking wet and, and very sandy. Um, that was not fun, but I'm really excited for the uh, the announcement video for you guys to see it. So. Can I just say I'm I'm really excited to see that video as well because when you put up that uh, that that teaser video of you standing in that spacesuit by the beach, all I could see in my head is just Lee slowly walking into the water at the ocean with a spacesuit. I'm dying to see that video and how that actually turned out. Yeah, yeah, it, it's pretty much like that very dramatic um not really dramatic but like it's like um w the weirdest thing i've ever shot in my life i think i destroyed my microphone uh but it was totally worth it we had like unexpected waves coming in in the middle um and kevin just put in our private chat that i should have dried the spacesuit before i put it in the box um that's a good point i probably should have done that yeah, I, uh, I think so. Are you going to put together a, a blooper reel of what is not being shown in that video? I would love to just see you in the space in the ocean be like, okay, uh, mic check and hold on, wave, wave's coming. Okay, wait for the wave. <laughs> wait, 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 hold on. I think yeah. that we now have a new tier, Lee, for people that donate. That's because this is a big thing. If you go on Patreon and everything else, they show you the bloopers and behind the scenes. Yeah. I think for like, the $15 level, you can get to see the behind the scenes footage of Lee making an absolute butt of himself. So oh, okay, I think, I'm fun. just saying, man, for real, I think you should do it. There we go. Okay, consider it done. $15, you get to see me uh, fumbling around in a spacesuit in the ocean, and my butt got super wet, so it looked like I was wearing a really big diaper. I fell a couple of times. Um, people like stopped by to take pictures of me, and I said, no, please go away, we're filming. Um, but they insisted. And it was just it was just a whole thing. It was a lot of fun, though. Uh, my friend Daniel helped to film that. And that was the first time I've seen Daniel in a while. So I was like, OK, Daniel, I'm going into the ocean in this spacesuit. Don't ask questions. Just hold the camera. I just want to be clear. Um, that's how Tim Dodd became Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut. He bought a spacesuit, put it on, went to Kennedy, and everybody wanted pictures with him, thought him that he worked there. And see, that's how Passage become, raises a million dollars, becomes the next big thing. I think you you just tripped into the zeitgeist, my friend. Dress for the yeah, job I mean, you want. Dress for the job you want. <laughs> and then when in doubt, go into the ocean with it. 
yeah. and completely I, ruin it. Well, at least you didn't I almost suffocate. <laughs> yeah, that was a very heavy suit. I mean, that that was that was not the safest thing I've done. Um, but we had precautions. We didn't go anywhere deep, um, but it was worth it. We got really cool uh, footage and photos. Can you put the photo up, Ron? Oh, uh, yeah. So I tried to put the photo up, but it's too big. So I need you to shrink it for okay. me to do less I'll than 20 megabytes. Down. Yep, I, I, like I tried to do it, and I was like, "Oh no, it won't go up." So as soon as you can do that, I'll be uh, thrilled to show it because it's it's a pretty great photo. I'll admit it's the first of many. This is just kind of like, yeah, just the first of many. I'm gonna I'm here on Photoshop. I'll do that right now. Okay, so Kevin says if we reach eleven thousand dollars, which we're only forty nine dollars away from, Titan will make an appearance. Send money to see Titan. Now that okay. may confuse people since this is a space stream, and you may think that somehow Kevin has pictures of the the moon Titan, and that's not <laughs> what we mean. There is there is a different Titan that he, everybody must know about because we've got pets everywhere. Behind Bianca is the most peaceful cat I think I've ever seen. I'm guessing it's a real cat, uh, and that it's not just you know it's like you know not in background because Kavi does not actually have a, a dog behind him and it messes with everybody because it's not real he's real to me he means a lot to me <laughs> yeah this is black pugly. holes in his tongue Everyone. and glasses pugly is actually a very important figure in my life um especially when i've been working on projects recently um he sits there and kind of helps uh, i was working on this project with uh, with a lot of radio data from uh, part of a collaboration with australia and basically, I was working on it with, a, with another computer scientist. And the entire time, she would often, you know, I, my background is physics, her background is computer science. And every so often, I would have to just walk her away from the screen while she did her thing. And she's, you know, much better at it than I was. And so I would just leave Pugsley sitting there in front of the screen just so that she would feel like she had some company to, you know, someone she could talk her ideas through. So don't discount the pug. That's all I'll say. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. So, Kevin is gone so i can't even ask him the question of who titan is which means i'm guessing the titan's getting ready to uh to to pop up so uh Kavi just asked a great question says ron will you be taking donation based requests for impressions uh so that's what happened last week i had to do neil degrasse tyson and carl sagan and other people yes if we raise enough money if somebody i think it was like 25 dollars donation i would do carl sagan and others so yes i'll absolutely do that kevin is back so Kevin, you have to tell everybody. <laughs> I don't know what happened. <laughs> he just left. Uh, so tell everybody exactly who Titan is, so that way they're aware if we hit eleven thousand, who it is that we're going to see. A Titan is sleeping under the couch right now. He's my dog. He is just over one year old. He is a cute little multi poo. He's a Maltese and a poodle. He looks like a teddy bear. It's the cutest thing you'll ever see. So if you donate forty nine dollars. I will get on my belly, reach under the couch, and drag him out for you all to see. He's adorable. And I, yes, of course, named him after the, the moon titan. He's a giant creature. Okay. <laughs> He's a giant creature. He's just big. Monster. <laughs> a little bit. When I got him, he was one pound. He literally he just fit in my, my hands right here. And now he's grown up to totally invade my work area. And it's awesome, but also very inconvenient. <laughs> Welcome to the world of being a yeah yeah being a being a fur dad. Lucky you. <laughs> so I, mean, I have to say yep. the uh, the cat scratcher behind Bianca, you it kind of looks like the mast of Curiosity with the big hole, and you've got like the white part oh, of it, the thing behind it. I thought I it was totally like, see that. model of Curiosity at first. <laughs> that is so cool. Well, now we have to make one so that way we can sell them, and then part of the uh, part of the proceeds then goes to Passage. So now we know it's the next thing coming to, uh, you have a Redbubble store, right, Sonia? Is it Redbubble or Spreadshirt? Or you have like all uh, of them? Redbubble, yeah. So now we know that's the next big thing coming uh, coming to Tanya's uh, story. Oh, is going to be a giant cat scratch curiosity camera. <laughs> I, I still owe you another shirt too. That one will have to be a surprise for people when I finish it. I actually still owe you, Kevin. You and Kevin shirts. From like last fall, that's because of me. My life got a little crazy, so we owe you one from Explore Mars. So that's on me. I think me, the so. whole world's life got crazy. So yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Everybody totally owes everybody t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, obviously, a big part of this tonight is uh, we're talking about passage, and you've heard all the cool things that you can be involved in. But 
obviously everybody here is a science communicator and everybody's got really great stories and I love uh, sharing the amazing people that I've been able to connect with. So I think one of the reasons that um, this can connect with a lot more people is when they get to hear these stories. So I'd like to t speak with each one of you and then kind of get into a conversation about it, about your favorite story where you connected with someone and then you became really great friends, you inspired them to get their degree, anything at all. I mean, even if it's a small thing where you told them, listen, you can pass this class and then they went and got, you know, a C in that algebra class, but that allowed them to kind of continue their path. So uh, is there anybody in particular that wants to go first or I can just go in my order that I have it on screen? Anybody that has a particularly great story? Tanya, you're on first. Ha <laughs> ha. You got stuck because for some reason you moved and you're now my side. We got to do the, hold on. We got to do the high five now. Oh, wait, is it? The other one. Nope, this side. Reverse. All right. Bam. <laughs> well, no, no, you can't go off screen. You got to be like right there. Wait, wait. Right. Three, two, one. Wow. Oh, man. Now I'm going <laughs> off screen. Wait, wait. One, two, three. One more time. One, two, three. We got this. One, two, three. Okay, close Where's enough. She? Tanya, go ahead. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, I think the thing that maybe stuck with me the most like an in-person interaction was um a few years ago i got asked to speak at the toronto march for science and it was extremely nerve-wracking i it was a group of like three thousand people standing in front of basically toronto city hall talking about why science is important and i've never spoken to that many people in a single go at, at one time uh certainly not live at least and after it was over a few groups of parents came up with their children, like little girls between, I'd say five and nine years old. And all of them were like, my daughter has never seen a woman that was a scientist before that I wanted to bring her to meet you. And I had to try really hard to not just cry because I thought this was sweet and like kind of overwhelming at the same time. Um, started asking them all questions about like, you know, what kind of scientist do you want to be? What's your favorite space fact? Um, Cause they didn't all want to be astronauts or, you know, uh, space scientists. One little girl actually told me, oh, I, I want to be a scientist, but I'm not interested in space. I, I said, that's totally okay. What is it that you're interested in? And she told me she was interested in archeology. span And so I asked her what her favorite things were about archeology. span um, and just like the experience of giving a talk, trying to convey to this huge audience about why science was important and them having that resonate to a level where they wanted their, their children to come up and like get to talk to a scientist to encourage them to follow their interests was, was just extremely heartwarming. And uh, it, it made me happy and, and yeah, just tearing up all at the same time. That's the stories that we're here for. I'm just going to pretend I'm not crying. Uh, uh, Dr. Patel, let's go to you next. I know you've got some great stories and you've already got, uh, you know, the majority of uh, the folks that are on here tonight have a bunch of fans, but I've seen a lot of love out there for you tonight. Uh, so please share with us, Prashanti. We'd love to hear what, uh, what your story is. I think um, I have experienced a lot here, but I think I'm going to do one. Uh, I'm going to share one from my trip to India last time. So that was in January 2019. Um, I generally try and do few events when I'm back home, um, just because I feel like I'm connected to my community. Um, and so the last time I went, it was the time when um, uh, the 100 hours of astronomy was running. And so I was asked to do one talk and over it just ended up being five talks five days in a row with different universities um, and different public events. Um, I think there were two things that struck with me. Uh, the one was that I went to this school, you know, it was outside uh, the city where I'm from, Ahmedabad, and uh, the students had prepared this large classroom. They had converted it into just this night sky and like, all of these models that they had made. Um, and I just thought like I was going to be there for an hour. That's what, you know, it was, uh, I was told I was there for like five hours. <laughs> um, they just had so many questions. They just kept asking me if they could do it. Uh, you know, and I'm like, yes, you guys are, you know, doing your graduation. Like, I don't see why you won't be able to do it. Um, and then on the third day, I went to this engineering college and, you know, I kind of mentioned earlier, a lot of people, there is this trend or I guess a stereotype that everyone has to go into engineering or medical uh, back home. And I, when I 
you know, could have gotten into um, with donation, um, I refused to go. And so when I was invited to an engineering college, I kind of had to share that, uh, that, you know, I could have been in your place, but I just decided to do what I really wanted to do. Um, and one of the students came up to me after and said, um, you know, I also wanted to be a scientist, but we have never seen any Gujarati scientists. I'm from a province of Gujarat and we're known as business people. We're, we're our lineage, everyone you know around is, is doing business. And so for someone like, you know, me as a girl, but then also as, you know, a Gujarati to be a scientist is very, very rare. So that student came up to me after and said, you know, I also want to be a scientist, but my parents are like, you know, who would want to be a scientist? You know, you, we don't even know anyone who is a scientist who is, you know, from our community. And he came up to me and he said, you know, I would wish my mom was here to see you today, to see how you became, you know, you're a Gujarati and you became a scientist. Um, and I would just, you know, hope to, you know, read your book someday, in which before that I'd even thought about writing a book. Uh, and he's like, you know, I would want to show it to my parents and someday to my kids that, you know, I couldn't become a scientist, but hopefully you can. And this was like a third year undergraduate student. I'm like, you're not done. You're just in your undergrad. You should be able to, you know, go into uh, into science after engineering as well. But just because of how things work back home, a lot of people just, uh, you know, remain an engineer, not really pursuing their dreams of whatever they want to do. Uh, but I think that one incident really struck with me. The amount of effort students had put in and um, and the fact that the feedback I got after, after that interacting. Is, I mean, we got, we've got some wonderful stories already. We're only two in. Um, Bianca, I'm going to go to you next, but first, uh, Dr. Harrison has to leave. She has to go film stuff because, like I, like she said, she she never sleeps and there's always the next thing to do. Uh, so, Dr. Harrison, we just want to get um, your your kind of final thoughts of, you know, why this is so important to you, why you're involved with, with Passage, and, um, you know, what, what it is that you're most excited about. You know, we got the master classes. We've got so many cool things that you're going to be a part of. So, just some final thoughts as you leave us tonight. I think that Passages is such a great initiative to bring all of these school supplies to you know thousands of students across Latin America and the Caribbean. And I'm, I'm really excited that Lee has brought so many people together to try and make this happen. Um, there are some schools that are participating in Colombia and I have family that uh, we helped immigrate to the United States from Colombia about 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, those family members are in STEM fields. And so that there's a nice personal connection there as well. Um, so everybody, if you are interested in helping this at all, like the rewards are a wonderful added benefit, things like the master classes and the chance to, to ride on the spirit of science and go to Kennedy Space Center and hang out with a bunch of us for a day. Um, but you know, also just think about the cause that you're donating toward and any dollar that you can spare is really going to help move this forward. So if you can donate, do so. And if you do, thank you from the bottom of my heart for supporting this initiative. So awesome. Uh, thank you for joining us, Dr. Ayers. And we know you have a very busy schedule, just like everyone here does tonight. Thank you all for being on. So far, we're only an hour in. We have so many more stories left to share. And again, we're getting very, very close to the 11,000 mark. And you know what? Uh, I'm going to do something crazy. I will shave my head if we get to $12,000 tonight. I will shave the curls and I will get yelled at. 12, 20, 20. Yeah. Come on. Aim well, high. well, I mean, I don't think we're going to we're I don't think we're going to get $9,000 tonight. Uh let's Not get if it with... you don't aim high, Ron. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> now I can't leave cuz I got to see this through. <laughs> well, you know you got to see this through. I think that we can do it if we can get up to I mean, this doesn't have to be all one person if we can raise and get to the point. So right now we're at 10,956. Uh, so if we get to $12,000, I will do it tomorrow. I'll even take a video of it. And uh, somebody very important right to me now. is probably going to yell at me because she loves my hair. Um, but I'm going to I'm gonna have to deal I'll with it. I'll shave that. mine, too. Yep. Do what? Oh, you'll shave, yeah, really? It's too late for that, Lee. So Lee's going to grow his out, and, I've got, and I'll shave mine. So the next I'll thousand shave, is. I'll shave half my head for you. I won't tell you which side, but you know. Well, like... You're going to just have to guess. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Good night, Dr. Harrison. <laughs> Good night, Tanya. All right, next up we are going to go to, and that completely threw everything off. So now we're at we're at Coffee. See, whenever somebody leaves, it throws up the whole, it changes the whole thing up. So let me do this. I'm going to put you here. So bam, Bianca, we're going to go to you next. Let's listen to your story. Uh, somebody that you've inspired, multiple people. If you want to, let us know. All righty. Um, I'm going to put a little bit of spin on this and talk about a moment where I was a little bit inspired. 
the Apollo 11 documentary that came out in theaters, was that last year or two years ago? Not that long ago. I went with one of my friends to go watch it and the movie theater was pretty empty. It was at like 11 p.m. It was the last showing. And at the end, me and my friends stayed because we were just talking about everything we just watched. But also there was two, a man and a woman behind us who also stayed and they were talking and we were all just there in our little group talking until the, I don't remember if it was like the janitor kicked us out. They're like, you got you gotta go. Um, and so then we all just went outside and we started talking, like our groups came together and we started talking. And so the man and the woman, they were friends. She was from, I think it was London and he was from, I wanna say it was Argentina. And we were talking about the moon landing and obviously I wasn't around for that. Neither was my friend who was my age, but they were telling us what they were experiencing watching it. The man was telling us how the TV was spotty. So they had to like, he had to hold the antenna in a certain angles so that his family can see. Um, and you know, we, it was just really cool to just reflect on such a pivotal time in human history and how different people experienced it. And it just gets me excited because I just think about how many more of those experiences we're gonna have. And I just think about like how many experiences I'm gonna have of those that I'm gonna talk about with my kids and my grandkids. And yeah, I remember when this happened, I was this age and you know, and now with technology, you're able to c capture that. When we see launches, everyone's tweeting about it. People are taking selfies with their screen and stuff or when they're there in person, they're taking live video. So yeah, it just really inspired me, again, going back to what I said earlier, the humanity aspect and how people are affected and how people experience these pivotal times in human history within their own lives and how it's just a little sp spike in just human existence and excitement. Absolutely lovely story. And uh, so next, Lee, do you have any cool stories? Have you ever inspired anybody before? I mean, is there anything that you've ever done that's, you know, maybe tried to raise money to to, to bring you know, really cool school supplies to kids or anything? Anything like that you've ever done before? Uh, no, not that I know of. Okay, cool. Uh, Kavi, we're going to go to you next, man. Tell us your really awesome stories, man. Um, I mean, the main thing that comes to mind for me is the work that I, I do with the Ramon Foundation. Um so for those of you who don't know, the Ramon Foundation is a nonprofit organization that was basically built in memory of um, the Israeli astronaut Ilan Ramon um, and of his son, who was a fighter pilot, um, Asaf Ramon. Um, and so, so both of them were, were uh, tragically taken uh, when they were way too young. And so um, Rona Ramon, Ilan's uh, wife, who, who passed away uh, uh, recently, she decided to create the foundation and to just focus on education in the best way possible and to inspire as many children as possible. Um, and, so, and so one of the big parts of the work that they do with this uh, at the Ramon Foundation is a program called Space Lab, which is a two year program from the start of eighth grade to the end of ninth grade, where these students, um, regardless of math background uh, and science background, they basically go from zero to preparing an experiment to get sent to the International Space Station. So um, I got a group of kids who, you know, some of them were a bit nerdier, maybe not professional nerds, uh, like we were saying before, but uh, some who were definitely more familiar with science and other ones who, who really, science wasn't their thing, they just thought it sounded interesting. Um, and so, so for me, this pivotal moment was at the end or nearly the end of this two year process when the students who had a limited science background and certainly knew almost nothing in advance about uh, stem cell research, were, were able to present their experiment that they were trying to send to the International Space Station to um, a team of experts from the private and public space industry. So we're talking about um, the, the heads of you know, the European Space Agency and astronauts and you know, private space entrepreneurs from Israel, Europe and, and, and States. And these kids, these, you know, these ninth graders are standing there and they're talking about stem cells because um, that's what their experiment was based on. They're talking about stem cells as if they were experts, as if they had at least two degrees in the field. And I was just standing there looking at the faces of, I think Garrett Reisman was, was one of the astronauts who was uh, one of the judges that year. Um, and, and it was just like shock. They, they, they were listening to the words that were coming out of the mouths of these 14, 15 year olds um, and not being able to associate the words with where they were coming from. And for me, that moment was just phenomenal to be able to see this process of 
you know, having spent two years working with these kids and, and you know, it's all project-based learning. So it's not like I'm giving them the information, I'm teaching them how to learn, um, how to think critically, um, how to filter out information. It was, for me, that was just an incredible moment to, to see absolute space profess professionals being blown away uh, by my students. So yeah, that was definitely a highlight for me. Oh, that's wonderful. See, we just all the smiles and stuff. So we have two things here. Uh, one is that Graham Lau, who if you've never seen Graham Lau, Graham has a beard that I can't even, you can't even see my hand. It's so, it's so long. And Graham said that he has not shaved his beard off in over four years. But if we have $13,000 by uh, midnight, basically midnight mountain time, that he also will shave his face. So Graham will shave his face. I will shave my head if we get to that $1,000 mark. And the reason why I say $1,000 mark is that we have just hit $11,000, which means Kevin's got to bring the adorable puppy in. Yay. Dog bribes. I love it. Okay. Let's have him actually like sit up. Titan. Hey, look at all the people. Look at all the people, buddy. Dad, I, I, Say hi. <laughs> Donate to Pat, please. Can you be friends with Open. Open. Good boy. All right, yeah. So here's Titan. Here's my little buddy. Yeah. <laughs> he's got another dog now. See, now he's going to show off. Look at him. Look, now he's posing. He saw another dog was posing. He's like, okay, fair enough. Oh, what was that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> No way. He's growling. He's growling. Oh, oh, oh he's out. He's getting a little scared. Absolutely what, out. Loves he loves to be a parrot. It's so weird. He likes to just like sit he's on my parrot. shoulder. He's no a joke. parrot, for real. Usually, the Oh, okay. Somebody out. somebody actually clarified is that Graham oh. can't shave completely. Graham has to go with mutton chops if we hit 13,000. So that's even better. So I'm excited to see that one because I've seen him with some crazy stuff and he said he would go, uh, follow it a few weeks later, he'll do the Klingon haircut, which I've seen him do before and that also is very funny. So uh, <laughs> obviously some exciting challenges thrown down because guys are just morons and we'll we'll do goofy things like that. So let's continue our awesome stories tonight. Uh, Dr. Fenara, we'll go to you next. Please tell us a little bit about some really amazing stories of uh, how you've been able to inspire people and possibly even how they inspired you. So my, my story is a little bit different. You know, anybody can be a scientist with a curiosity of how the world works, some drive and determination. And, and I've always said that it was actually the line on the uh, kids animal show that I did. Um, and, and I got, I got a, an application for an intern. And I looked at it, I was like, no way. She had no science experience. She was a photographer. She had four kids. She was just in the first, like, like she was at University of Phoenix, maybe a semester in. And it was just not a good fit for what I needed because I'm very hands off. And someone turned to me and said, anyone can be a scientist with the curiosity of how the world works. And I checked out her Facebook page and she was super passionate. And not only that, if she has four kids, she can definitely help me with the rest of the interns. And on top of it, she was 35. So I brought her in. And so she, the beginning was, it was a little bit rough. She was really timid. And then I started realizing that all I had to do was push her a little. And every single time I pushed her to do something, I, I told her to, you know, go and do an analysis on her own with uh, the ecotoxicology department, she cried. She cried on the elevator all the way down. She got down there, she did it. I had her go on stage for my rap concert. She didn't wanna do it. I was like, communication's super important. She got on stage anyway, she cried the whole time, but she did it. Every single thing that I've had her do, she did it and she crushed it. And now I left my marine laboratory and she is running my department. She ended up graduating with her undergrad degree and now she's looking at master's programs and she, she's just like, I love her. Uh, Aspen, she's in all my videos that I do, uh, well, that I used to do when I was at Moat. Um, but, but check her out and follow her to the ocean later. She, she inspired me. Um, 
but I'm just, I'm so proud of her and all the interns. I've had like 35 of them and every single one of them I've been so proud of. They've really stepped up. That's so awesome. You get a lot of fans tonight out there, Tracy, too. So obviously you're doing some great work. Uh, no, we're, we're... I think that they're asking fans. <laughs> well, this, uh, this is a great one here because uh, you can actually tell Ricky is wearing this shirt, like the Inspector Planet sh- T-shirt. And you can, if you look at it, you can actually see it. So that's kind of <laughs> cool to be able to tell it. So, and Ricky has been wonderful all night, uh, sharing a lot of wonderful stories and, and thank yous and, and so on. So Ricky, thank you for being here since the beginning of the show and just being truly supportive of everybody on here. And we've had so many great people. Um, and Brandon actually, uh, you know, quoted, uh, Dr. Fenera saying anyone can be a scientist or an engineer with some passion, hard work, and an innate curiosity of how the world works. And, uh, yeah. You got it. That's it. So that's awesome. that's, that's can I, it. Can I just add to that or comment on that? Absolutely um, not, quick. Kevin. I'm just kidding. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> We're best friends. I'm kidding, everybody. Do not think uh, that I was actually being me to a plague. <laughs> no, of course, of course, of course. Um, so yeah, Ron, you more than anyone know uh, the the struggles that I've had with my with finishing my degree. So I'm actually in the sixth year of my undergrad in physics, um, and I've had a bunch of uh, personal issues along the way and some uh, complications. Um, but I am three courses away from finishing my degree, and there is a very real potential offer for me to continue and do my doctorate um, in Australia in about a year from now. And so it feels like all those times that I was personally struggling, um, you know, with with that idea of whether or not I could be a scientist, um, I suddenly, you know, I feel like the, these past few weeks, I feel like I'm getting back onto that track. Um, and definitely, like uh, what Dr. Tracy was saying before. Um, anybody who has a passion for it can be a scientist or engineer. Personally, I got told by uh, people along the way, um, maybe you shouldn't, maybe you should try some, something else. I mean, I had um, the secretary of my department at the university say to me, uh, maybe you're just not cut out to be a physicist. Um, no, anybody who has a passion for it absolutely should go for it um, because that's what science needs. Science needs people who are passionate who can not only do the work, but can share it with other people and inspire the next generation of scientists. So just wanted to, to share that there. I love that. And it actually reminded me of a really great quote. So a science communicator that has um, really taken off this year, and she was wonderful before this, but this year in particular, because of her sharing her story too. Um, so she had a double, um, um, double uh, breast, oh, wait, I'm sorry, she had both of her breasts removed. So that way she could, because um, she had like a 95% chance, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but she has like a 95% chance of getting breast cancer. So she documented the entire story, told everybody about it, but she's also an incredible science communicator. And she's the one that kind of, was one of the first people to talk about Beetlejuice and everything that was happening with Beetlejuice. So she's uh, uh, Serafina Nance. She's had this incredible year and a very popular um, tweet that she put out. Uh, just something to remind everybody that this is not easy really for anyone. And she said, four years ago, I got a zero on a quantum physics exam. I met with my professor fearing I needed to change my major and quit physics. Today, I'm in a top tier astrophysics PhD program and published two papers. STEM is hard for everyone. Grades don't mean you're not good enough to do it. And there's so many science communicators, space Twitter in particular, where people are going to tell you this. Um, this is something that, while while Kavi was really having a hard time with what he was doing, he was helping me try to pass pre-calculus for the second time, which I did. And Lee mentioned that he, there, through all the calculuses, I think you failed the calculuses nine times total, all of them, nine before you just got your degree. Calculus. There's a lot of those stories. Uh, yes, please, Dr. Patel. Hey, um, you know, Interestingly, when I came to Canada with all the struggles of like an immigrant, um, I actually failed my second year, which is actually the, one of the most important um, courses in astronomy. Um, and luckily, uh, University of Toronto actually allowed uh, to to you know take out this one course out of your transcript. Um, and so I got lucky that I was able to take it off the transcript, but I failed it. And I realized the strategy that I really needed that everyone wasn't working in groups and, you know, everyone, the professor actually allowed people to work in groups. I got so disheartened that I was, I didn't really have any friends. I didn't really talk to anyone. Um, and so I couldn't actually score. Um, and, and next year I was actually able to take that course again, you know, make, make friends for the first time, uh, in Canada. And, um, and I got an A. So, you know, and then I went on to do a PhD. So, 
I share this story a lot of the times because people think that, you know, you got to be like, like it was said before, you got to be genius in physics or, you know, got to be genius in math. Oh my God, I have taken so many math courses that barely passed in my undergrad. I still got a PhD and I still did research. Like if, if I wasn't going to be a science communicator, like I would have still gone onto the path that I envisioned for myself. Um, so, you know, nothing is impossible. You just need to be persistent and patient with yourself um, and, and just not forget that the passion or the dream that you have had. So everyone can do it. Hey, Ron, you're muted. Awesome. I just love when I do that. That's like the fourth time tonight. <laughs> Donate $20 for every time I'm muted when I start speaking, and we'll be at our goal in like 15 minutes. Uh, Angelica, I, I see that, that uh, you, you shared with us that you have a really cool story that you want to share. Um, and also, too, if you want to share not just this, but if you want to share um, anyone that you've inspired or how somebody's been inspiring to you and how it's kind of led you along your way, feel free to share that as well. Okay. Um, so I have a, a cool story about this. Um, this is kind of how I became a science communicator by accident. Um, I actually had a teacher in high school ask me point blank, this is a biology teacher, if I was stupid because I couldn't answer one of the questions she was asking. And, you know, you're taken aback for a minute, like, oh, my God, am I really meant to do science? And, you know, you go through all these things in your head because uh, you're not a teacher. You know, it's different when somebody else tells you, but a teacher, you know. Um, so funny story. I um, <laughs> I took a NASA sticker when I when I made it over to the neutral buoyancy lab over at Houston. I took a NASA sticker and I wrote on it, you know, thank you to the teacher that called me stupid. Um, this was for you. <laughs> you inspired me to push harder, and I posted that, and it went viral. <laughs> so <laughs> that's how I, like people kind of like knew about me and started like noticing all the things I was doing with NASA. So anyways, quick moral of the story is that like, you know what, what people say is completely irrelevant and it is hard, you know, I should, <laughs> I can tell you it's hard. I'm doing it right now, um, but it's worth it. I think it is, every penny is worth it. Agreed, 1 million percent. Uh, so, I mean, Kevin, you didn't have anybody that inspired you along the way. There's not a book that you read all the time or a movie that you watch on repeat or anything like that that you ever do, anything like that at all. Throw it out there. I mean, if, if it's a new story in particular that nobody's ever heard about you before, please let us know. Um, October Sky, have you ever heard of that? Um, I am going to alter the story a little bit, Ron. Uh, I'm going to share one that I don't normally share. So Love most it. Of the times I share that it took me, you know, Three years, over 150 applications to get an internship with NASA. Georgia Tech rejected me for grad school and then paid my full tuition and gave me a stipend. JPL rejected me and then I got the job working on Europa Lander. That's the main story people know about. But I struggled a lot too, not just like getting into NASA and into grad school, but academically. Like I got kicked out of one of the math classes and bumped down when I was in seventh grade. They're like, you know, you're, you're just not performing well enough. I had to take pre-calc and calculus both twice. I dropped advanced chemistry. I was in AP physics, dropped to accelerated physics, and then dropped to physics, just basic physics, my senior year of high school, because I just wasn't getting it. I wasn't, wasn't cut out for it. And I was like, man, this stuff is hard. Like, I want to be a NASA rocket set. <laughs> there it is, two NES and beyond. All of this is in there. That is my memoir that I've written on <laughs> Amazon and Audible. But I was like, is this like, am I cut out for this? Because when I told people, not, and these people didn't know my like academic background, but I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin. And I said, hey, like, what are you going to do when you grow up? I'm, like, I'm going to work for NASA. And people literally laughed in my face. I even had an uncle who was like, NASA, like, that doesn't exist anymore. The space shuttle was retired in 2011. I'm like, no, it still exists. You know, people just like laughing in my face. And I, I hear these stories um, from the rest of the people on my team. And I'm like, I feel like I almost had it easier compared to what I'm hearing out there. It is amazing the adversity that you all have gone through and are still going through to, to chase and pursue your dreams and, and keep pushing. If you ever need someone to lean on, please reach out. I'll do my best to help you get through these situations as uh, so many people have helped me get through. So what Ron was alluding to before is October Sky is the reason I'm an aerospace engineer. I watched it when I was 10 years old and knew that I wanted to be a 
NASA rocket scientist designing spaceships. So shout out to Homer Hickam. Now, to talk about what, like a story where I inspired someone else, or like what really resonates with me is actually my very first SciComm experience. I just got done with my NASA internship and came home for Christmas, and I went to visit my sister, who's 10 years younger than me at school. Like I, whenever I'm home from, from college, I'd go and have lunch with her at the my old elementary school. And my fifth grade teacher was still there and asked me to come and speak to the class. I was like, speak to the class? You mean you want me to present to a bunch of like third, fourth, and fifth graders about NASA? She's like, yes. I'm like, okay. So like I stayed up all night. I put pictures all over. And it was pretty much just like pictures because I'm like talking to elementary school kids. But like their little eyes lit up and they asked so many interesting questions. And I felt so satisfied. I felt selfish that I felt so good after telling people, these, these little kids that I was working at NASA. But to, to come full circle on this, not full circle yet because I'm not that old since this happened, was years later, my fifth grade teacher reached out to me and she's like, there are a bunch of second and third graders who heard your story weren't doing well in math. Titan's missing someone's home. Titan agrees. <laughs> that, Titan, come on. Uh, weren't doing well in math. Decided they <laughs> Titan, sorry about that. He loves the story. <laughs> he's, he's a fan. He truly is. So it was years later after this presentation, my fifth grade teacher reached back out to me and told me that there are many kids that I spoke to who are now pursuing paths in engineering and science who didn't think that they were going to be able to before. I was like, I had that kind of an impact. And this was before I actually really got into SciComm. I did that one event and then went on to grad school and really just focused on on my own work instead of uh, speaking to others. And it's amazing that the type of feedback that I get, even today, I've got this on my office right here. To our favorite rocket scientist, it says up here, um, Pluto is still a planet. And then inside, it's like all of the the signatures from the kids. I have an entire file. Wait, wait, wait. You have a tattoo? I never knew that. I'll tell you about that in a sec. I have an entire okay. file cabinet in my office. It's a button. Full of these. Full of things. Like this is from uh, Bart's Middle School in Portage, Wisconsin. Actually, just this year, 2020. There's so many that just come in. And even on Instagram, three days ago, I believe it was, I got a message from one of my followers who said, Dude, I did it. I'm listening to you. I moved to Tennessee to start my degree and left my old life behind. And I'm like, dude, that's so awesome. Like, I'm so excited that you're going for it. Okay. Tattoo. Total sidebar, right? So <laughs> I am engaged. Uh, my lovely fiance, Brittany, just walked in the door. And that's why Titan went all crazy. And we're heading. What up, Brittany? <laughs> she can't hear you, Ron. And we're having quite a long engagement. So. Men don't get engagement rings. And if I wear something here, it's like I'm married, which I, I won't have a problem with like wearing something there. But so this is my engagement ring since we've been on a two-year engagement now. Um, we're doing the financial way of not spending all of our money on a wedding and then going, oh, crap, we've got bills and debt and all this stuff. So that's my tattoo. It's the engagement ring. That's the only one I got. That's awesome. Oh, everybody collectively on the count of three. One, two, three. Oh. Some of us were muted. But <laughs> and she's actually wearing a NASA shirt over in the, uh, the kitchen area over there. I can't turn my computer, but she rocks the gear. Oh, of course she does. I, I synced it. <laughs> so um, I actually absolutely do not have a question right now. Lee. This is this is your baby. Anything that you want to share with everybody as uh, as we continue the conversation tonight, and let me think up something because I wasn't prepared for that. I thought that we actually like some somebody left, and then it was like surprised, and I didn't know it was coming, and so I am actually for the first time caught off guard. This is rare. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess I could say say my little story. Um, and oh, never mind. Kind of, um, so, okay. Kobe, did you? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so, so passage was actually supposed to be a thing many years ago, uh, but I was a student. I just graduated this past summer, and uh, I've always wanted to use aviation to, to make the world a better place. I've been a pilot since high school, uh, and I've been flying with my dad since I was uh, five months old. You know, he carried me on a little thing. Uh, he just passed away in August, 
Um, but you know, this, it's kind of strange that the project launched right about the time that my dad passed away. Um, and he was a pilot as well. That's how I got into aviation. Um, but you know, I guess it, it kind of worked out in a way that like I could do it in his honor. Um, and he was my inspiration for, for flying. And, um, in terms of passage being a thing, I've always wanted to do something good with aviation, like since, you know, the beginning of college and planning all these different things, uh, a flight around the world, a flight around the 50 states to, you know, visit schools and get kids interested in science. Um, but this is passage specifically, the fact that I spoke to all of these schools and, and got to meet some of these students, some of the students actually are um, aspiring videographers, which is what all this is, this is a production studio. Um, and I actually got to work with some uh, kid videographers and, and they made some content for Passage that we're gonna post very soon. Um, and already just the overwhelming support and all of the, um, all of these science communicators getting involved with this project everyone says the internet is such a, a harmful thing, you know, people addicted to their phones and um, people not being able to function in social situations and, and everyone feels more isolated than ever. But now in a time that we're supposed to be isolated, things like this can bring people together. And uh, yeah, there you go, Ron. This is um, something that we're going to be uh, announcing very soon uh, to the public. Besides on this live stream, this is uh, when I went out to the beach to film a uh, an announcement video that we're going to be giving away um, astronaut training positions in the Mojave Desert with a company called M Mars, um, they're legit, and I highly recommend you donate twenty five dollars right this second. Get your name in the drawing early, and um, you can read more about it on our website. The information is already up. The official page for the sweepstakes will be up later, um, but it is all paid for. It's an absolutely incredible opportunity. Um, and that's just a little tease for uh, when I got my butt wet in the ocean filming that video. Worth the photo, though. I was going to do it in the desert, but I live in Florida and there's no desert. So um, anyway, just like the Internet is such an amazing unifying thing. And people like Ron and Kobe on this um, live stream I've met in person of it, and without the Internet and, and the space community and the science community, I would have never met them. And uh, I would have never met everyone on here and everybody watching and commenting and um, interacting with us right now and, and throughout the night. And uh, we can use that to leverage good things and to make change. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, the internet comes with consequences. Uh, people getting confirmation bias and uh, affirmation that what they believe is correct. So then we have the flat earth community and we have people that don't believe in space. I actually went to the flat earth convention, which we can talk about if you want. Um, but it, we, are, as science communicators, as people that believe in science and what- That Flat Earth video is like George R. R. Martin's next book in the uh, Game of Thrones series. It's a mystery and apparently it exists. And one day you'll see it, but not yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming out. It's just this whole, you know, coronavirus or whatever um, stopped us from filming. So the equipment is right mm -hmm. there, there. Um, and it requires a bunch of people to film. So we're waiting until things get a little bit better and we get a schedule shoots. So, but passage is, uh, very important at the moment. So I do want to put all of my attention on that. I'm barely working. I'm just completely <laughs> working on passage. So, um, I think with the help of everybody that's donating and being a part of this and, um, potentially joining us at Kennedy space center, if you donate 200 or more and get a ticket for that event, um, and everyone working on the project itself. Uh, we're going to uh, reach our goal. We're going to make a difference. And uh, we're going to do bigger things in the future and see where this leads. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's it. Eat love, your veggies. Love, 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 love it. So Kevin's got to go. Um, it's a secret mission he can't tell anybody about. Um, we're we're going to keep it on the, gonna keep it on the DL. Uh, but Kevin, uh, let, give us some final thoughts here. You know why why you're so passionate about this project. Um, uh, anything else that you want to share with us before before you leave this evening? Uh, but thank you so much for joining us and uh, giving us some of your time after what was a very long road trip back home. Uh, you know, doing uh, doing the stream with us tonight. Uh, well, first off, Ron, I want to say thank you to you for MCN and doing all the logistics and 
figuring out all of this, you know, you make me large when I'm talking. It makes me feel special and important. <laughs> so thank you. And then thank you, Lee. Says for the actually. six foot six American ninja warrior that does backflips in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and thank you to, to Lee for, for creating Passage, for like taking this, this idea, this vision you have and actually following through and bringing together us um, and, and everybody to create an amazing team to actually make this dream come true. It's not a dream anymore. There are tangibles with it, which is, <laughs> which is awesome. Put me on the spot, Lee, because you are the spotlight. You are making this happen. And it's amazing. I'm so grateful to be included. And I, I really felt that I wanted to join this because that, that is my mission is to help bring space to everybody. And I know this is more than just space. This is science. This is all of STEM. And to reach out to underprivileged communities down in Latin America is just another aspect where I'm able to use the, the tools that I have in my experience to, to help make that happen. So it is amazing what you've put together and everyone who has been working on this. So if you're watching right now, please. Donate some money. Help us reach this goal so that we can deliver all this amazing school supplies and flights. And heck, you can even you know meet some of us if you want down at uh, Kennedy Space Center in the future. So once again, I'm just like super grateful to be included in this. And Ron, Lee, and everybody else, you're awesome. So I got to go on my super secret mission now. I'll see you when I return. <laughs> Bye, Kevin. Cheers, Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Take care. Uh so we got a uh, we got a, a great hey, comment here from uh, John Reed. Uh, he is a popular author. Actually, his book is right underneath Kevin's book. Uh, but I have already replaced my mo my Mova Globe. Uh, bam! There we go. And he is uh, he has hired a, sp a Spanish translator for his books, and he's going to uh, donate some to Passage once they have been translated. So that's uh, really exciting. And that kind of came about after the last event. Hold on, let me uh, let me make you full screen. <laughs> They're really good, and. Um... So uh, I think John, we talked. We, we talked about um, he's actually going to be uh, revamping these books for the Southern Hemisphere because that's Latin America's um, sky, uh, for the most part, most of Latin America. And um, there is the actual book, Fifty Things to See with a Small Telescope, which we are actually giving them with software and projectors and all that stuff for the teachers, and an accompanying workbook. So we're going to be bringing a bunch of these. This is actually a sneak peek of some of the stuff that we are. Um, going to be bringing to them says so spotting things in the sky they can complete um kind of missions and and uh uh finding things in the sky and um marking it down what they saw and compared to the actual constellation um so he, these are being translated and john is doing an amazing job with these books they are best selling on amazon i believe or it's up there there's thousands of reviews for these books and they are absolutely amazing so thank you john uh for getting those to us these are great such awesome stuff. And we actually do have a question for the panel. Uh, let me scroll back up to find it here. Actually, we've got two of them because we got one from Space TV uh, Net as well. Uh, but the first one is, this comes from uh, Ricky. And Ricky says, how does the panel overcome and deal with the feeling of imposter syndrome? And I know it is something I am riddled with, so I can't wait to hear what everybody says. So, uh, Dr. Padel, I'll go to you first. Then, uh, Dr. Fanara, I'll go to you after her. This panel is feeling exactly what you just asked to talk about. Um, I think uh, I have, first of all, I think I I try to, uh, you know, process everything I do, uh, which I don't know if a lot of people do, but, you know, try to just make sure that I look back at my year every year, reflect what I have done, reflect where I want to be, um, and just, you know, I have accepted uh, the fact that, you know, it took me a while to actually accept that this is something that I could have. Um, I just, you know, it took me a while to accept it. And when I did, I think uh, just having this notes and being surrounded by friends and family who keep reminding me that, uh, no, you're doing great. You know, this is how much you have done. Sometimes I forget what I have done. And they they start to remind me. And, and that, you know, helps me with my story. I don't think I've, I've gotten rid of it or anything. Um, Every time I meet someone, I'm like, oh my God, how awesome they are. Like, am I like really supposed to be in this league? 
uh, of people that I'm hanging around in this room, you know, um, every time I say that, but I think the couple of things that have helped me is, is noting down everything I've done, reflecting on my year, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, I'm also taking uh, time for myself, uh, you know, making sure my mental health is, is taken care of, uh, you know, uh, during the year and especially at the end of the year, because that's when I'm kind of burnt out, uh, trying to think about whether or not I achieved what I wanted to for that year. Uh, and then surrounding with friends and family who just, you know, know that this is a thing and uh, and they just have to A, bear with me when I do, go, you know, say things, uh, but then have to keep reminding me that, uh, no, there are things that are of value, even if it's for one person, uh, what you did throughout the year uh, makes a difference. So, yeah, that's really how I have done. And I hope to hear from others what they have done. Love that answer. Uh, Dr. Fanar, we'll go to you next. Hey guys, so imposter syndrome, that's just part of, part of, I think everybody's life. If you're challenging yourself and you're growing, it's, it's always just part of that cycle. You know, like for me, it, it kind of starts with imposter syndrome. I'm like, I don't like, and I'm going through it right now. I'm in a new, completely new role. It's a pretty important role trying to, uh, develop a unified earth systems model so that we can better understand how the earth works. Like it's a huge, <laughs> it's a huge undertaking. And I'll tell you what, like right now it is, ugh. but I know that I've been through this. I've been through this over and over and over again. And I know that every single day, I'm just going to work harder and harder. I'm going to gain that confidence. The confidence is going to get to a certain point where I'm going to step it up and take some risks something isn't going to go right <laughs> and i'm going to be right back down and it's it's it is a cycle but this cycle is moving up every single time you're moving a step up and not making those same mistakes uh communicating science through a crisis is uh that's when you're really faced with every vulnerability in every single word that you communicate um, Florida Red Tide was a big deal. Uh, economy was crashing. People couldn't go to the beach. People's health were suffering. And everybody was seeing these, these dead megafauna wash up to the shoreline. It was a big deal. And everybody wanted to point the finger at someone. And, and for me, like there were so many misconceptions and miscommunication, misinformation. A lot of what we're seeing now on, on even bigger, um, I shouldn't say, I should say bigger geographically. Um, topics like climate change, um, so much in misinformation. And if you say just the smallest, e even if you you talk at a higher level, then someone else can actually retain that information. And then they change what you were saying. Like it can go really bad. So imposter syndrome while you're communicating during a crisis is just something that's going to have to come with the territory. And if you care enough about changing the world and making the world a better place, you'll get through it and, and you'll step up that cycle for the next time. Um, I've definitely made a ton of mistakes uh, and I'll make a ton more uh, every day. Um, but if I wasn't, it wouldn't mean that I, it would mean that I wasn't growing. So that's, that's what I tell myself at least. It's, and I think that's big for all of us. I mean, I never thought that I'd do the things that I've been able to do. And uh, you know, it's something that we mentioned, I mentioned on the last show too, is that, I'm in barely in my second year of community college, but you know, uh, I did have a 20 year career of speaking in front of people, being a DJ and MC and doing a lot of those things. <clears throat> and that allowed me to find my way and my path. There's a, there's room for everybody and your voices are extremely important. And that's what, you know, everyone on here has been just such a, um, a, a massive example of tonight is that there's people that are, that are looking at you and are inspired by you. And we've had comments, about everybody on the show tonight that have popped up, uh, which is which is great, and uh, so I'm really excited. So Angelica, is this something that? So you, I feel like yours is almost like a reversal. Uh, I didn't plan on doing this, and then my teacher said something stupid to me that I was stupid, and then I was like, ha ha, let me tell you something. And so that kind of became a thing. Have you felt the imposter syndrome <laughs> thing yet? No, um, I mean yes, I have, but not the same. It's not backwards. If anything, it's even more of an imposter syndrome. You know, <laughs> it's funny because I didn't even know that was a thing. I, you know, you guys bringing it up right now. I was like, oh my God, I'm not the only one who feels like this. But um, what I learned from my experience, especially because I'm still a student, right? So it, it always feels like I'm 
faking it. <laughs> Still, in fact, before I even stepped into this panel, I told a friend, um, gosh, it's a real scientist, you know, I'm just... I'm just trying to make it still. <laughs> so it's 100% true. Um, but what I learned from it is that um, every, number one, everybody feels like that. Um, and number two, it's important that we share it um, and that we discuss it openly, um, especially because I think any scientist that does anything remotely um, important at some point feels like their voice is not strong or maybe doesn't carry the way that we wish it would does. Um, so it is important that we share it and it's like, hey, yes, you are in fact a real scientist and you do feel this way. Um, and it's normal and um, you know what? Like I said, I'm, I'm still a student, so I feel it all the time. I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I am a science and communicator kind of by accident and like, should I even be doing this? And then I look back at all the people that um, follow me and that care about my story, especially, you know, from Venezuela, which is one of the countries um, listed here. And in fact, I saw a comment about uh, another Venezuelan student from Graham Lau, her intern, that doesn't have a lot of electricity, so she has to do, you know, work when she can. And it's, it just reminds you, like, hey, like, I am doing something important and it matters that I do it and it matters that I share it even if you know at some point i feel like i'm still faking it but yeah stellar stellar stuff and next up lee ever felt that before anything's ever you know happened to you made you feel like i mean i know that it had to be so even when we were in the finalist phase for the student astronaut contest and like we all the, the group had just become good friends I know that that enough was making me nervous. I'm like, oh my god, what happens if if I win this? Like, what happens? You know, I'm I'm excited for anybody, but I don't know how I'm going to handle this. Like, this is the dream, and I just made a video thing, and now I might be on TV. That's crazy. And you know, you got to really live and experience that. What was that like for you to be able to do it? In particular, like, it's not like directing and doing this stuff as something on the side. It's literally your handle. You really want to make the first real movie in space. Sorry, Richard Garrett, if you're watching this, my fault, man. We're friends, but my bad. Uh, but uh, yeah, we, you want to make the first full feature length, film, feature full length feature film is what we mean. Uh, so um, maybe you end up, uh, you know, uh, doing Tom Cruise's movie. <laughs> but what is there anything? Did you feel imposter syndrome for that? Do you still feel it? Or when you get a project like this that connects you in such a way that it doesn't even cross your mind, like this isn't about me, this is about you know the project and what we're doing and the, the kids we're going to inspire? Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> so there's a there's a quote that I that I kind of live by in a way. It, it's um, your attitude determines your altitude, um, and it's so easy to um, get caught up, you know. In, in in today's world, social media kind of shapes you into the person that they want you to be. Um, even if you don't, you know, you even if it's not like a direct thing, you feel like you have to put on this face and this image for people. Um, and I've suffered through that for a long time. I, I, you know, if you watch my old shows, uh, like my, my very old science shows, like in the beginning of college, like I was trying to be this Bill Nye and, you know, it's, I wasn't trying to be Lee Giat. And, um, it, it's, sometimes you have to take a step back and, um, figure oh, out that's what how you say your last name. Yeah. I've gotten, G I've gotten Giat. I've gotten Gilead. I've gotten Grant. Grant is very popular for some reason, even though there's there's no R in there. <laughs> um, I like or to say, N. <laughs> or N, yeah. I mean, just make whatever last name you want to give me. Just go for it. Garfinkel, you know, whatever. Uh, giant, I could see. Giant, maybe. But, but Grant, just, that's just going a step too far. Yeah, that's just not it at all. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, it's, it's like for the student astronaut thing, I was, uh, what was I, a junior in, in college? I think so. But... This was after failing, you know, algebra in high school and Calc 1 and Calc 2 and just a load of, of science courses um, multiple times. And there are people that are, you know, interning for, for certain companies and um, are about to graduate with, you know, degrees in aerospace engineering and astrophysics and other things. Um, and people that are more established. And I'm just this kid who keeps failing math class. I feel like a complete uh, failure. <laughs> yeah. Um, and this was my baby to begin with film and, and video production. That's what I've been doing since I was seven. So I, I kept telling myself, I'm not a math or science person. 
I'm a, a creative and I just have to accept that. But I was so focused and I felt like I could do it. And, you know, even my mom, my parents, everybody was telling me just do film, you know, just be a filmmaker. Um, and if you put all your energy into film, then, you know, you'd be successful at this math and, and science thing. This astronomy degree is not worth it. Um, but uh, you just have to sometimes take the hard way and, and do what you feel is the right thing to do. What is internally, what is your gut feeling? It's 99% of the time, right? Um, even if it's the harder thing to do, um, you won't have to suffer through uh, feeling like you're trying to be somebody that you're not. Um, so don't be the next Bill Nye or the next Neil deGrasse Tyson or the next Emily Calandrelli or whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, just be the first you, you know, um, just, I don't know. And this is kind of my way of doing that in a way, just um, seeing if I... Did you steal my uh, line from last week, Lee? Well played. I steal your line? You stole my line from last week because that's what, what I said one? to Emily. I see how you are. Uh-huh. You, you just, Emily? I said that Emily is not the next Bill Nye or the next Neil deGrasse Tyson. I'm like, you are the first you. And she remember because she was like, oh my God, you're making me cry. And you don't even remember <laughs> it. You were on the show. Now my now my soul's doubly hurt. I see how it is. I thought we were friends. That's cool, Lee. I'll be over here. Okay. So, so, so if, <laughs> if you end up shaving your head, I'll shave half my beard and then this half of my head. So it'll be like a, a checkerboard. I'll make it up to you. Now we're up uh, to yeah. three. There's so much shaving going on. Now we have the shaved psychon. Everybody shaves. <laughs> we have $12,000. I will be a laughing stock for about a month. Um, and I'm on camera a lot. So this is going to be interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, just, uh, yeah, that's all I had to say, really. It's just um, passage is kind of my way of, of doing what I think is the right thing to do to the absolute best of my ability. And if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, then I'm a complete failure. And that's basically it. Just do the best that you can and um, do it because you believe in it. So, yeah. So it works Love and adore well. the passion, man. Uh, so uh, before uh, before we get a copy uh, for his, Angelica, uh, I know that you said that you had to leave. So uh, if you want to share any final thoughts with us before you uh, bow out tonight. Um, you know what? Uh, what we're doing is really important. And it might, you might not realize the impact it has yet. But once that video comes in of the kids and once you start seeing what it actually goes down in Latin America when you introduce science, oh man, it's going to be worth every penny you donate it. It's going to be worth every one of these panels we do. Um, I know because I've done it. Uh, we mentioned it before at a smaller scale and it's always worth it. And I never regretted it. So this is your chance to donate and be part of something really big and important. That was very smooth. Awesome. Well, thank you, Angelica, for joining us tonight. We know you got to go study and do that awesome stuff. So thank you for joining in. Uh, if you haven't seen it, Lee, I think she'll have some stories up from yesterday. Oh, where he wait. Fought. Yep. Angelica. We, Angelica and I, we made up a uh, passage handshake. I don't know how we're going to do this. We can try doing it on this. But uh, we were on the news yesterday for passage um, here at the local Spanish station in Jacksonville, Florida. And we made up a, a handshake. So um, I guess we all got to do it now. Because I said so. <laughs> How do we? I mean, I don't know that we can do the fa the handshake virtually, but I guess we will do it at Kennedy Space Center next year, or this that's year, next true. year. When, when's the year? When are we doing Kennedy Space Center? When if this works out that's, next year? That's right after the flight. That's so. Once the flight is over around January 2022, uh, we're going to spend three months editing the documentary, um, and in June 2022, I think it's June, like June 8th. I think I'll have to double check what what we reserved it for but um yeah that's uh it's june 2022 is is the uh documentary premiere at kennedy space center and it's gonna be awesome we got food we got drinks we got uh everybody here and and much more uh it's gonna be really cool so um definitely an exciting exciting event with uh, very important people showing up needed passage tiktok video like a swipe version or something tracy can create and can create and wrap the song fair enough fair enough so we got another challenge Absolutely perfect. Uh, so, Kavi, anything you uh, want to share about the imposter syndrome? And I want to share a great story after that. Um, one of my all-time favorites that I always that I've shared more than one occasion. I think I might have even shared it last week. It never gets old, and it always just kind of gets me in my, in my heart and my soul. So, uh, Kavi, you want to share your story of imposter syndrome? 
I mean, like a specific story, I'll, I'll think of it while I'm talking, but like I had to say first that everything that everybody had said until now, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think I think that we all face challenges, uh, even outside of the world of science, you know, people face challenges and things that they're working towards. And especially if you're choosing to go down the route of working towards something that you're passionate about, rather than just saying, oh, I'm good at this, I, I guess I can just do this, um, you're going to face challenges. And it's super important to to know how to accept that and to not get you know get down in the dumps and to be too hard on yourself and say oh you know i failed this one thing i guess it's all over and it's all ruined um i think you have to you have to be able to to look at your uh failings like dr tracy said uh, to, to to look at the the places where you didn't succeed and to learn from your mistakes and to work forward from there um and i think that that, that one of the one of the problems is, like Lee was saying, people tend to compare themselves to their idols. And I think it's a really dangerous um, uh, thing to, to get stuck in when basically you say, oh, well, you know, by by such and such an age, uh, you know, this person who, who I want to be like them, they already had, you know, uh, 10 degrees and, and four books and a Netflix series. And um, it, it's you have to compare yourself to to yourself. Meaning, don't look at what other people are doing. Look at yourself. Rather than saying, I want to be as good as Neil deGrasse Tyson was at my age, compare yourself to who you were who? yesterday and say, okay, I just want to be a little bit better than what I was yesterday or, or who I was last year. And I really think that if you take things in that perspective and you really you know, uh, judge yourself fairly and not harshly, I think it really helps with the imposter syndrome. It's something that for me, it helps when, you know, I can look back on, on you know, uh, the, the first uh, calculus courses that I was taking my degree, which were courses that I had to repeat because, you know what, didn't have a strong math background and it wasn't easy for me. But I pushed through it and I look back on it now and, you know, I see that material in the, in the courses that uh, I took later on in my degree. It was kind of, you know, I'd have these moments where I would look at this material and say, oh, this was hard for me once. And now it's a lot easier. Now these are the sort of problems that I'm hoping to get because they're easier than this next thing that I'm working on. So yeah, I just I just want to agree with everything that um, all of these other amazing speakers who are with us have said. Um, you know, compare yourself to who you were yesterday. That's I guess the summary of that rant. Sorry. <laughs> I love that. Beautifully, beautifully said. <laughs> So, Yeehaw, <laughs> Cuff FA, Yeehaw. Uh, so, this is one of my all time favorite stories. I love this one. And if you can't hear it from, from these two people and say, oh my God, that's incredible, and I'll also get the feels, I, 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 I've read this more times than I can count. I've done it on more than a few live streams, and I adore it. And the reason why I'm bringing it up is because uh, one of the people that has, sold, uh, has told us that he will shave. Uh, his face into a into mutton chops if we hit thirteen thousand dollars by midnight tonight. Sorry, twelve thousand dollars. Twelve thousand dollars by midnight tonight, and we did just get another fifty dollar donation from uh, Abigail Bolenbach. Uh, so we're uh, we're moving up another one of the incredible science communicators that is part of the team as well. And then uh, Malik Malkali is uh, was the one that got us to eleven thousand uh, dollars with his exact forty four dollar uh, pledge that he sent in earlier. So again, we have broken eleven thousand dollars tonight, which is always exciting when we see that number flip over um so we're, we're really excited for that as we inch towards uh the big goal so that way i'll shave my head and look goofy um so this is a story from neil gaiman and uh it's it's absolutely wonderful and uh they uh the per ducks wear uh, wear hats <laughs> ask the question uh hi i read that you've dealt with imposter syndrome in the past and i'm really struggling with that right now i'm in a good place and my friends are going through a lot and i'm struggling to justify my success to myself when such amazing people are unhappy I was wondering if you have any tips to feel less like this and maybe be kinder to myself, but without hurting anyone around me. It's a big ask, I know, but any help would uh, make my life a lot less stressful. And for in particular for me, like, I've had a really, really great year, and it wasn't something I was expecting. And especially in 2020, to have just success after success after success and success and just be like, I don't know how I feel about this. You know, this makes me feel really bad that so many other people are suffering and, you know, how do you kind of get beyond that? You know, even in success can be 
stressful and scary in a world like this when everybody around, else around you is really struggling. So I love this answer, and it's just super, super beautiful. Um, first part is, uh, the, best I, uh, the best help I can offer is to point you to Amy Cuddy's book, Presence. She talks about imposter syndrome and interviews me in it and offers helpful insight. Uh, the second best help might be in the form of an anecdote. Some years ago, I was lucky enough to be invited to a gathering of great and good people, artists and scientists, writers and discoverers of things. And I felt that at any moment they would realize that I didn't qualify to be there, among these people who had really done things. On my second or third night there, I was standing at the back of the hall while a musical entertainment happened, and I started talking to a very nice, polite, elderly gentleman about several, about several things, including our shared first name. And then he pointed to the hall of people and said words to the effect of, I just look at all these people and I think, what the heck am I doing here? They've made amazing things. I just went where I was sent. And I said, yes, but you were the first man on the moon. I think that counts for something. And I felt a bit better because if Neil Armstrong felt like an imposter, maybe everyone did. Maybe there weren't any grown-ups, only people who had worked hard and also got lucky and were slightly out of their depth, all of us doing the best job we could, which is all we can really hope for. And if you don't get chills at that, then I don't believe that you were human. Um, because every time that I read that or hear that, that's just a beautiful one to me. So there's a bit of an answer to that question that you asked. I think everybody here has been sharing some really uh, awesome ones. I think we have um, one more great question here that we can cover before we wrap up tonight. Let me find it. I gotta scroll. We've got a lot of really great comments here. And this one's awesome. This is from uh, Brandon. And Brandon said, what advice would you give to the younger audience interested in STEM? And I'm going to go reverse order this time. So, Kavi, I'm going to start with you and then come back through. Oh, wasn't, wasn't expecting that twist, the, uh, the reverse card. In what a right twist! There. Um, <laughs> draw four. No, um, I, I, I think that, that what's really important is to... To work on these on, on these topics in STEM, and to come at them from different angles. I think that uh, people get stuck in the traditional ways of approaching these problems. It's like, oh, if you want to learn math, so calculate, you know, uh, how much it'll cost if uh, John Smith wants to buy seven hundred watermelons at fifty dollars a watermelon, which is psychotic. But I, I think that as as the next generation moves into education and 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 you know, makes this more accessible. Because that's, at the end of the day, it's what it's about. You have to be able to make STEM accessible, to look at it from different angles, um, and, and to really try to not just look at, you know, the raw problems that are in the textbook, but to try to say, okay, so how is this applicable? Um, if you are struggling with trigonometry, but you think space is cool, maybe look at, you know, the way that the ancient Greeks used trigonometry to, to calculate the circumference of the earth or to to calculate you know the movement of the planet from the sky and then you'll have this kind of thing motivating you and you can think okay so it's not just dry numbers in a textbook this actually has a real world application so so things like that that felt like a really abrupt ending like i thought i didn't realize that you were done i thought that there was more coming it's, like, it's something like I that feel like i like... have a lot more but I, I want to hear more from, from Dr. Tracy and Dr. Patel. And <laughs> also, there, there are these weird moments that keep coming in and out where I I think because it's 5 a.m. for me and we've been on this call now for, for two hours, I keep wondering whether I'm asleep or not. So if that's why it was a bit abrupt, um, it might have been because of that, but I apologize. But yeah, I'd love to hear from, from um, the other speakers. Love it. So, uh, Lucifer, I think it's to you next, and then we'll go to the doctors. So, what what is the? Uh, I'm trying to. to Can you rephrase the question? Just because I'm having trouble, I guess, coming up with a specific. Sure. Story. Let me uh, let me scroll back up to it again here. Because, like I said, there's what advice would you give to the younger audience interested in STEM? Um. I guess just uh, do a little bit of everything. So, so when I was, I mean, I'm not, I guess that old, I'm getting old and it's scary, but um, I'm 22 and I, I just graduated college and, you know, I'm fresh out of the education system. Um, and I guess the biggest thing I can say is, um, do you I'm know- I'm getting you, old, I guess, I'm 22, whatever, Lee. <laughs> Hey, because I'm it, totally a year after I'm allowed to legally drink. It's not fine. It's I'm old. Whatever. I know. I, I've got a AARP coming up, and you know my joints are hurting, and 
I mean, it's over. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, for, for the younger audience and, and for, I guess, every, everyone in, the, in, in school right now, especially in this weird time, um, I think just take this time to figure out what it is that you want to do um, hypothetically for the rest of your life. Life is long and there's a lot of time to do different things, but what is something that, that has been the constant like thing in your head um it could be in stem and i hope it's in stem because how, how do you use it to better your community how do you use it to better your life how do you how can you use what you're passionate about whether it's robotics or coding or uh, astronomy how how do you use it to to have some fun and, and to make a living doing it and um how can you then leverage it to better your communities or, or even the world um and so for me that constant uh, actually, a few of them. It was aviation, astronomy, and um, filmmaking. And this project kind of encompasses everything that I can offer. And I'm just, I guess, putting it out there. And all of the science communicators on this team are doing the same and, and putting their minds into this as well and pushing it as much as possible. So um, I guess do what makes you happy. Do whatever it is that you feel like you can do. Um, and, uh, you know, take this time to experiment, you know, don't wait until you're in college and you're changing your major five to six times and you're just struggling to find that identity and have a little bit of a crisis. Uh, so use this time where you're not paying your own bills to just go crazy, figure out what you want to do, do a million different things if you can. And I guess pick one or two or three and go from there. Love, love, love it. Uh, Tracy, we'll go to you next. Uh, so the question is, what advice would you give to the younger audience interested in STEM? Hi, guys. Uh, this is a tough one because it usually depends on the kid. Um, because I have two different uh, kind of approaches to this. I'm, the, I'm an athlete, and I'm also a tree hugger. And there's one part of me that says, oh, you know, fall in love with the environment, go on hikes, understand how the world works. And the other side of me is saying, make sure you take calculus before going into college. School is hard. You've got to overcome that. But when it really comes down to everything, you know, I and just in my experience dealing with kids, it's like they get the ones that are interested in STEM at a young age is because they're good at it. We all love what we're good at naturally, right? Because it's an easy pathway. We feel special. We feel like we have it, you know, we found where we fit. But what I've found is that a lot of those kids that find math and science really easy when they're younger, when the math and science starts to get harder, that's when they get scared. All of a sudden they're like, oh my, what's going on here? They've never really had to study. They've never really had to overcome those obstacles. And those kids that were struggling the whole time, they actually have an advantage at that point. And that's where we lose a lot of those kids is at that point. So I think it's really important to, if you're a, an educator, a, a parent, to really tell those kids and show those kids that, that those obstacles are normal, that's natural. And, you know, science, Science is hard. It's like, do you want to play a video game like Super Mario Brothers 1 where you can just skip to the last board, up, down, up, down, AB start, and, and pass the entire game? No, that would get boring if you were doing that every day. And for some people, that's what they want to do. But if you want to be a scientist, you're going to be playing different games every day. You're going to have to pass a new board that you've never seen before. And that's exciting. And yeah, you might feel like you're always losing, but but there's always a win. There's always something to gain, and there's also always something to look forward to. So for me, inspiring the next generation that that want to pursue a degree in STEM, I I kind of tell them to exactly what Lee was saying: be as diverse and well-rounded as possible, so that you can go in any direction. You do never know when you're going to find what what inspires you, what you're passionate about. For me, it was you know, first learning about Love Canal, but then I took a little detour into sports and boys. But I came back when I learned that unsafe drinking water was a leading killer among children. That really, that that moment 
made me want to change everything that I was doing. I was re ready to do something, whether I was paid for it or not. And that's really where you find your passion. So for young kids interested in STEM or anything else, just keep your options open because you don't want to miss that moment where you find what, what you're really passionate about, what inspires you, because so few people find that. And, and if you're not open to receiving it, it's going to be that much harder. Beautiful, beautiful Love stuff, it. indeed. Well, that was great. Uh, Farshadi, let's go to you next, share a little bit. Um, but one thing we do have to say is we have a very special thank you going out to Jeff Setzer. And uh, this one is, this takes Ooh. off onto uh, Abby's. I think this might actually put Abby over the $1,000 mark on donations now. Uh, Jeff Setzer just uh, donated $200. Uh, so, Jeff, thank you. You're interesting a story. We're now $750 away from a whole lot less hair up in his head. So, uh, thank you, Jeff. And uh, Farshadi, let's go to you next. And, um, yeah. Thank uh, you. I think all the other, um, you know, psychomers here on the panel have said something that I agree with. Uh, explore as much as you can. You know, before I was introduced to space, I actually had all kinds of books, everything from history, geology, uh, geography to I, I wanted to be a fashion designer at some, <laughs> at some point when I was young. Um, one thing that did stick with me, I always wanted to be a detective, a criminal investigator. Um, so I sometimes call myself stellar detective because I studied stars. Um, but, you know, like I explored very many different areas before I actually came in uh, contact with space. And uh, I, when I did, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. So I would say, you know, just like what everyone else has said, explore, um, you know, figure out what you like. If you're passionate about STEM, I would say, you know, if, if you have the passion be persistent and you know there will always be I mean we've talked all about our struggles you know uh, today and all of the scientists you know at least that I have talked to have had their own set of struggles so you know reach out to people uh, scientists love talking about you know their work uh, things they have done I think they did to overcome uh, you know whatever they're doing uh, and and you know when you see them doing that it, it might give you that boost that you need uh, because you know you're already passionate it's just those things that obstacles that are you know basically stopping you from doing what you really want to do and those kinds of things can actually help you very much so you know reach out uh, talk be persistent um, be passionate just just do what you're passionate about if you're passionate about it I think you know there's nothing in the world that can stop you uh, from doing what you want to do so yeah that's that's what i would say can i just say that's that's amazing and i i totally agree with what you're saying and that's honestly the exact way i think that scientists have to make themselves accessible in that way um all of the all the scientists who i've interacted with since i first got interested in, in physics and in space have uh, for the most part have been exactly like that where there have been people who i've reached out to and with no obligation, they've responded to me, they've given of their time. And that's actually how I first got in touch with the research advisor I've been working with these past few years, who, Dr. Patel, you'd be interested to know, is the only other person I've heard use that term, stellar detective, um, because the the work that, that, uh, that we do is mostly um, using radio astronomy to look at um, core collapse supernovae. And so he'll often refer to it as kind of like a crime scene investigation where you have to look at the spectroscopy and, and look at the you know the, the the interaction of the radio shock with the circumstellar medium to figure out you know to kind of work backwards and figure out what happened with the progenitor star beforehand so it very much is kind of like detective work so it's, it's great to hear you think of it like that as well i agree and i've actually used that a lot of the times when i'm in classroom um, and and you know generally uh, students ask me why like you wanted to be detective like a criminal detective and how you are now an astronomer and i'm like well there's a connection with a lot of things that exist here on earth as well as outer space and so you know i wanted to be a detective but it doesn't it doesn't mean that i just wanted to be a criminal detective right i was really interested in solving problems and and uh trying to take whatever evidence is given to me to figure out you know a solution so uh in space it's the same thing you're trying to figure out sim in stem so you know uh, i love that there's another solar detective <laughs> you're so right and i think that also, like you, you can you can relate a lot of different things, uh, a lot of different you know professions or passions that students might have to space. Um, 
And I think that it goes all the way from detective to time traveler. Like I've had students say to me, you know, I don't really care about science, um, but like, you let me know when science invents time travel. And I say, well, you know, hold on a second, try to think about astronomy for a second. And then I, and I go into this whole, you know, long rant about, um, you know, the light only reaching us now. Um, it's a discussion that I love having, especially when my students talk to me about Doctor Who <laughs> and uh, the whole wibbly wobbly, timey wimey space thing. Um, so yeah, there's definitely uh, uh, um, <laughs> to, uh, um. to make, uh, 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 to use space as a tool to inspire people, regardless of, of what, um, what their passion is. That really ties to space very well. Kids love aliens and no matter what they want to study, they somehow want to meet an alien. So, you know, um, I, I, when I talk to them, I tell them, well, it's got to be some form of STEM. You're going to make something to be able to talk to them or, you know, find them, <laughs> become an astrobiologist. Um, so, yeah, there are tons, you know, space is uh, obviously like I'm talking about space now, but space is one of those kinds of things that allows, it's so interdisciplinary that you can talk about everything from looking back at Earth and protecting Earth to, uh, to looking for another Earth in the universe. Absolutely. I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday and nice. I just saw Graham's wibbly wobbly timey wimey gift. I'm glad that somebody picked that up. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine yesterday who's uh, an archaeologist and out of nowhere, he, he, you know, we're talking about archaeology and suddenly he says, oh, by the way, you know, it's really cool. Um, archaeoastronomy. I think, I think that's the, the correct name for it. Yeah, um, archaeoastronomy. That's correct. Archaeoastronomy. Yeah. And then, and then suddenly, you know, I study, I study uh, astronomy and he studies archaeology and suddenly we're having this whole conversation about um, you know looking back in time um, with amazing software like Stellarium if uh, any of you guys know it um, where you can actually see what the stars looked like um, 2,000 years ago and you can see what they will look like in the future and so it's also a really interesting way to connect archaeology and history um, you know to, to be able to know what the night sky looked like for different cultures um, at different times throughout history. Yeah, I love that. I love um, like bending people's minds and then their perceptions of reality with uh, with astronomy and, and software like that. I used to work at a planetarium and do those types of shows where um, it was a digital uh, panel like to control the planetarium. So I could fast forward time. We could literally do anything we wanted. So what I would do is I would connect the constellation lines to where they are. So um, and then what I would do is I would fast forward time, you know, to 10 million years into the future and and way more than that actually. And what would happen is, let's say these are the constellations, they would start kind of moving around and, and in the end you just see a bunch of lines in the sky. Um, or when you can take the North Star and, and you just put it up on the North Pole, you know, where you would see it right above you on the North Pole and then just spin everything around you and, and people just, you know, something clicks. And um, I think like you guys were saying, it's so important to um, to get people in that mindset, even if they're not in STEM directly, they have something to offer. Uh, whatever it is that they do, they can kind of put their mind into it. And that's, you know, what helps like with the movie Interstellar, um, you know, it's a movie and and they had people like uh, Kip Thorne work on the actual science behind it in the black hole scene and, and um, Carl Sagan's uh, time projection thing for the fourth dimension. Um, and, it ended up being super accurate in terms of the black hole picture that we saw just recently. And Kip Thorne got the Nobel prize for that along with his team. So um, just this marriage between arts and sciences and, and everything else in between, um, I think is really important for everybody to get involved in, and just get interested and in just, I guess, talk about it. I think that's the really important thing that helps us move forward. Lovely, lovely stuff. So before we go into um, final thoughts from everyone. Lee, I want to give you the floor for as long as you wanted to give. Um, one, for people that might be joining late, exactly what passage is, what the bonuses are, the cool things that we're going to be up to. Basically, talk as long as you want to because I need to go make another drink. But it's very important that you share with everybody all the cool stuff that we're doing. And then we're going to go to everybody's final thoughts to wrap up the evening. So give everybody a breakdown the cool stuff they can be involved in. We're going to Kennedy Space Center. We're making a movie. Like, we're doing so many cool things. And I'm just, I'm so stoked about it, man. I can't wait to hear what you got to say. 
All right, go get your drink. I got mine. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so for, for anyone joining in late, um, we are doing this project called PASSAGE, which stands for Providing Aid in Science for South America's General Education. We're flying a small cargo research plane called the Spirit of Science to Caribbean and Latin American countries um, throughout South America and all around there. Um, on our website, you can actually see the flight route, uh, which is actually going to change. We're, um, if we go beyond our budget, we'll be able to visit more countries. Um, which it looks like we're going to be doing uh, through our amazing partners and everyone that's donating and helping out. Um, we're making amazing progress. So thank you everybody for donating. Um, and uh, by donating, you'll be able to provide uh, school supplies, lab equipment, laptops, uh, classroom supplies, projectors, stuff like that. Um, and telescopes, microscopes, coding software, robot kits, and a whole lot of other things that are going to help kids succeed. And it's not just, um, the important thing I want to stress is that it's not just donating and dropping off supplies and being like, here you go, kids, enjoy. Um, we have collaborators that are doing amazing things. Like recently, John Reed is donating a bunch of these books and translating them into um, their native languages. Um, and we're making this uh, Passage Masterclass series with all the amazing science communicators on our team that is essentially a huge library of video material and educational content for different varying fields in science and STEM um, that are gonna be loaded onto these laptops that we're gonna be giving to these kids in schools, um, along with other things like Wi-Fi and stuff like that. So we're, we're talking to each individual school and seeing what it is they need. We're not just, you know, we don't have pre-cut cookie cutter kits and then one school doesn't have electricity and we're giving them a telescope, you know? So um, we're trying to, help these schools as much as we can some of them are better off than others um, but nonetheless all of them need our help so donate as much as you can these are great kids passionate teachers i've spoken to a lot of them already and we have um, some amazing discussions with them coming up soon um, so trust me you want to be a part of this we have amazing things coming up as well for for everyone that donates including recently um, we announced that we are doing astronaut training uh, crew position giveaways so we're giving away six astronaut crew positions courtesy of m mars formerly mars academy usa they're they have a state-of-the-art martian training facility a big dome uh, and they're trying to build a mars colony so you guys will be able to um apply if you donate 25 dollars or more you'll be put into this raffle that will allow you to do real astronaut training you'll even get a certificate at the end certifying you that you've done martian astronaut training uh, by an organization partnered with um super legit organizations in aerospace so um definitely highly recommend you donate 25 dollars to do that but there's also much more t-shirts patches um access to these master classes access to our documentary film about the entire uh journey through latin america and um the thing that i'm really excited about and i think all of us here on this stream are excited about is if you donate 200 dollars or more like recently jeff did um, you'll be able to join us at Kennedy Space Center for our documentary premiere. Everybody on this stream is going to have the opportunity to, to go and, and all of the other team members that are either sleeping or busy right now. <laughs> so um, highly recommend you guys check it out on our website. We have all the rewards listed there. And um, Ron will shave his head if he hits uh, or if we hit $12,000 today. And I'll do a checkerboard thing where I'll shave this part of my face and this part of my head. So, um, if we can, and mutton chops for Graham, and mutton chops for Graham, super exciting stuff. So we appreciate everything and anything helps, um, tell your friends, tell your science enthusiast friends, um, and just everybody that, you know, schools, if you know anybody in Latin America, just spread the word like crazy and we're going to make this happen and everything is going to work out the way that it's going to. So, um, we're all really excited for this to happen. And you know what? I'll go a step further. If we end up having like a really good day, because you know it is middle of the week, sometimes people don't have time to watch this. So if we hit it by midnight tomorrow night, I'll still do Same it. Here. I'll yeah. give people some time so that way, like the tweets can go out. So if you haven't shared this yet, please retweet it. Um, you uh, uh, so it's streaming live on Twitter uh, via my uh, Twitter page, which is at the T H E E Space Dude. So you can find it there. It's on uh, Facebook on Passages Facebook page. It's on the Flying Ostrich Media page on Facebook. Uh, it's also on my personal page on Facebook as well as. Uh, at Stardom Space on Facebook, um, Twitter, I think it's on Twitter too there, uh, Twitch and YouTube. Share it out as much as you can in between now and tomorrow, and uh, if we hit that we hit that goal, I'm totally down. 
Um, although it is getting cold here, I think it's supposed to like start snowing in the next week or two. So I will have to I'll have to deal with that for a while. Uh, so let's go to final thoughts for the evening as we wrap up. So uh, Parshadi would like to go to you first, and uh, any thoughts that you want to share with everybody why this uh, why this platform is so important to you, and uh, why you uh, why you're reaching out to people and hoping that they donate. two reasons. So one thing I didn't mention in my introduction is um, I also do STEM education research uh, in Faculty of Education here um, at Western. And uh, the research that we conduct is basically looking at our programs and looking at the engagement students are having in the program and how or whether or not it changes their outlook towards um, space and having a career in space or just being curious about space. And what we have seen in the last four years of running the programs is that students actually I see a difference in them because we get to uh, do, uh, you know, we get to do the survey before and after, um, and and we see that having those hands-on activities, having those interactions with the scientists, um, having been able to actually be exposed to these kinds of, uh, you know, different areas of space, uh, they have been able to uh, say on the survey that, yeah, this has increased my, uh, you know, uh, curiosity for space. Uh, I might be taking up a career in space. And so I know that these kinds of things can actually make a difference. So, you know, when Lee came to me, um, saying this is a, a project that we're planning and would you be on board I, I was like of course because you know i know the the kind of difference it can bring to students and how it can change their outlook towards their life whether it, whether or not they go on to pursue stem um i personally think that you know even if they just get uh excited or curious about it um and then just go and explore by themselves i think that itself is a starting point uh, they might inspire someone else who may, who may then go on to into stem so uh you know for me it was it was something that was uh, very much about uh, you know, what I study and what I see in my everyday. Um, and then the second thing was that, you know, I I love talking to students. This is why I do what I do. Um, and my reach is generally in, in Canada or in India because that's where I'm from. Um, and it's not anywhere other. So I feel like, you know, this gave me an opportunity to help students uh, somewhere else, not here in Canada, not in India, but somewhere else uh, around the world. And And so, you know, Thank you, Lee, for this opportunity. And I would say, you know, donate whatever you can, $1, $100, $1,000, uh, anything that you can give, uh, you know, you will make a difference uh, for these kids. Can I said it more beautifully. Uh, Tracy, we'll go to you next. Thank you, Dr. Patel. I, I'm just so honored to be part of this mission. You know, we know more about Mars than we do the depths of our oceans. And what that says to me is that there's a lot of science still to learn. And we need as many people doing it as possible if we're going to solve these big, big problems and answer these huge questions that we have to protect people um, and to extend humanity's time on Earth. And uh, what what this organization is doing, what Lee's doing, is incredibly important and you never know you you never know who you're going to inspire and what they're going to end up doing um but i'm just i'm just honored to be part of this thanks for well, thank you so much dr Fanara. and well we'll go to kobe next and then we'll we'll finish with lee <laughs> um i think i think yeah i i, I definitely want to want to echo what dr tracy said like it's such an honor and a privilege for me to be part of this, to be part of a team of, of so many uh, amazing people um, and just, you know, phenomenal science communicators and researchers and innovators uh, from around the world. I, I, I think that one of the things, I mean, jumping back to what we were saying before about imposter syndrome, one of the things that uh, a lot of the time will encourage me and make me feel a little bit better about where I am uh, in my career is that there are definitely points I can look at and I can say that single person, that's somewhere where I had an effect. And 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 it really makes me feel like what I'm doing is, is all worth it, just knowing that I've made a change in one person's life. And so I think here with this, uh, with the Passage Flight Project, we are going to impact so many lives and any single one of these 2000 plus students in Latin America uh, uh, could be uh, the innovator or the scientist behind the next important invention or the next important campaign or project uh, in Latin America that, that 
you know, you, you just don't know what kind of follow-on effects will, will, will happen. So I'm really just uh, honored to be a part of this. <clears throat> I think everybody who, um, you know, can spare a few dollars uh, should, should go to the GoFundMe page and donate to support um, this amazing cause. Um, because I, I really, I really do feel that way that this is just, you know, one of, one of the best causes I've seen come my way in recent times. So uh, donate a few bucks and, and make a difference. Awesome stuff. And uh, Lee, we're going to go to you next. Yeah. I'm uh, I mean, just kidding. It's 8.30. All right. Thank you, everybody. We're so excited. No, I'm just kidding. 8.30. <laughs> it's 10.30 over here. Yeah, yeah. You, you, got, you got one minute, Lee. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> please wrap everything up, man, for all the awesome stuff that you do. Thank you for you know bringing all of us together for this and allowing us to be a part of uh, this big dream and to help uh, share science communication um, in a new area. And there are other people um, that are out there that, that you're – many people out there that you're inspiring through this and allowing us to be a piece of this I know is, is a big honor to – to us all so uh yeah man your final thoughts yeah i mean um like we we kind of said this on twitter um i think like a week or two ago uh this is kind of the avengers of of you know passage and and each of us have a certain thing that we specialize in and um are able to offer this project um uh, and everyone that's helping to leverage passage is i guess a part of this you know avengers team and um we're working to to make it happen and as Kovey said and to kind of uh, piggyback what he was saying <clears throat> this is not just a one-time thing this flight is is bigger than anything that's really been done in a very long time in this way um in a way that's going to you know attract the international media and and to raise awareness through our documentary film and uh to continue education initiatives through our passage master classes and on top of that um just following up with these schools and these kids and seeing where they end up and how they've bettered their communities and what careers they're chasing and um, having this mentorship program where we, we figure out what best, what are the best ways we can help these kids in the future when they're not kids, uh, you know, and, and this is going to leave a long lasting mark um, and an amazing impact throughout Latin America. And some of the kids I've been able to speak with and the teachers that I've been able to speak with, um, and the schools that need our help, um, they are more than willing to get there. They just don't have the resources or the opportunities to get there at the moment. So um, spare whatever dollar you can. Um, obviously, anything helps, um, but definitely check out what rewards we offer. We're partnering with some organizations, uh, like we said earlier, to um, give back to you guys uh, for, for just helping out. So um Everything is appreciated. I am privileged to be working on this with many amazing people on our team, and um, we're going to make it happen. And and that's kind of the mindset that I've been having um, this whole time. So let's make a difference. Let's use our abilities and, and our expertise to do so. And stellar. And, nope. Yeah, stellar yes, is the word. Um, and of course, thank you, Ron and um, Stardom, for for hosting this live stream and emceeing and um, helping us with this little ticker thing that's scrolling across the bottom of the screen and all that fun stuff and all these toys around me. So, um, yeah, thank you, Ron. Yeet the Giat. Um, and, uh, yeah, I want to see Ron bald. So help us get to 12,000 by tomorrow. I will also, um, checkerboard my face with hair or a lack thereof. <laughs> it's going to be brilliant. Brilliant. Fantastic. That's the only thing I've liked so far about Doctor Who. I'm a season plus in, and everybody's like, it's the greatest show ever. And that's the only thing that I've really liked about it. Thank you, Kavi, for lying to me. I'm like, oh, it's so great. You're going to love it. I'm like, it a weekend. Better. It gets better. That's what everybody said about The Office, but we won't go into that. That's for next show. Uh, <laughs> Tracy's face was great. That was perfect. I'll tell you, I'll tell you one of the reasons now, one of the reasons I don't like The Office is because we have some people that live either downstairs or upstairs that are complete and just do not care about other people around them. And at two o'clock in the morning are playing that full blast where you can hear it. It's woken us up from dead sleep before. So that's one of the reasons I'm not the biggest fan of the office, but I'm just kidding. I haven't seen very much of it, but I'm, I'm not kidding about the story. That's true. Uh, but I've, I'm not seeing very much of it, but I know everybody's like, Oh, it's after the first season. It just, it gets so good. Let the figure Michael out. I've always heard all the, uh, all the, uh, the, the defense of it. Like if you can get past the first season, but you know what? We all had to say the same thing about Star Trek The Next Generation until Riker grew his beard. 
So there is that. It's the phenomenon. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming on and joining us tonight. Lee, can we go ahead and say that we're going to do the next one on October 28th, two weeks from tonight? Um, what do you think? I think we can. October October 28th, um, we're going to go with tentatively. Um, Lee is definitely going to get me the stuff uh, less than two and a half hours before we go live. I'm really excited about that. Uh, So we'll see who's going to be on here. I mean, there's still a ton of other science communicators. Maybe we'll get different mixtures, and they're always great stories. Um, He's brought a lot of great people together. So thank you, everyone. Again, donate, donate, donate. Uh, Help us get to that 12. (laughs) 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 I swear if you slay to the office, I will drive down to your place tonight and take care of business. Graham, it's not funny. You were just in a really, you were in a place that, that you needed it. Okay, so I dare you to. If you come down and we raise, uh, we raise the money, then uh, we will shave your beard and uh, we will shave my head tomorrow night. And then you can yell at me for not liking the office. We'll make a video, put it on TikTok. Yeah, just, <laughs> you have to just like with the razor blades, just. <laughs> shave each other's beards and heads. <laughs> it's, a, it's a razor fight. That's how it's going to go down over the office to raise money for passage. I love it. See, we're always coming up with new ideas. Exactly. <laughs> Embarrass yourself for, for money. I will gladly do that. He's stoked. <laughs> Lee's just gonna be Lee's gonna be at home, just like sl- like slowly shaving his face and laughing, like ha ha ha. Look at the monster I I've created it. for science. <laughs> <laughs> you all were uh, awesome. Thank you uh, to all of our guests tonight. We've had so many, and we can't wait to see you again on the twenty eighth. Remember, donate, donate, donate. Uh, it'd be awesome if we could hit fifteen thousand before the end of the month. So, uh, Lee, when's the when's the end of this? Is it going until? We raised the fifty thousand. Is there an end goal? I don't think I've ever asked you that yet. Like, is there? We have to raise it by this point. Um, I would say let's raise our goal by the end of the year. I think that's a good uh, place to set it. You heard it here first. By the end of the year. Um, but um, yeah, I mean the fundraiser will be up until we hit our goal. Uh, maybe a little bit after. Um, but let's say by the end of the year. That way we can announce who wins our Martian training thing early. So the sooner we get there. Um, we're going to start working on our initiatives and making those masterclass, uh, masterclass videos um, and everything else that we're working on. So um, we have a 5K race coming up next year as well that we're working on. There's just a lot of fun stuff that we're working on. So um, the sooner we hit our goal, the better. But let's say by the end of the year, uh, we want to raise $50,000. Love it, and you guys have a great time on that 5K race. I'll be uh, I'll be ordering Grubhub and cheering you on. I love you all. Uh, so thank you so much once again, everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight, and we will see you on that next live stream two weeks from tonight. Thanks, Ron. Bye, guys. <laughs>